You're on. Talk uh, about your squash I, cock. I, I didn't see the. Uh, I didn't see the five, four, three, two, one this time. Oh, yeah. Anyway, squash cock. Yeah. So we were just talking about. Uh, yeah. So anyway, welcome everybody to Eclectic Soundtracks. Skunk Manhattan, Vic Ramos, and our our guest uh, is Guy Laverick, uh, all the way over from. Uh, are you in um, Sunderland, Newcastle? Where? Uh, what? I mean, what's the? Yeah, kind of the England? edge. The edge of Sunderland. How far are you from when I visited you uh, and like your your parents? Right. Do you, do you know? Do you remember that thing called Pensher Monument? Yeah, which is right across the street from their place, right? Right. So I'm like on the other side of there now. Okay. So I'm, I'm literally sort of two miles away from from there. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, we were talking about Eddie Van Halen pa- uh, Van Halen passing away because one of the bands I play with, Invincible Zars, is doing a tribute of. Some kind of wacky Van Halen. Boy, talk about we've got some serious haters on that shit too, man. These some of these. Do you are, really? Oh man, some uh, go to the Invincible Zars post the uh, whatever the initial post of that is. The actual video. page. Yeah, it's hilarious. I mean, really? there are people just hating on it hard. Uh, yeah, this Why? is a disgrace. This just oh, I can't believe what I just said through is horrible. Oh, we, we, love it. we think it's hilarious. I mean, it wasn't. Still- Josh is a huge Van Halen fan, and we, you know. Uh, the video is kind of a funny, you know, video, it, you know, um, it just sort of came together that way. But we obviously it was it's not meant to insult Van Halen. We're, you know, everybody loves Van Halen, you know. People are just too easily offended, mate, honestly. Yeah. They actually yeah. look for it. It's like, I can't believe I sat and watched this thing all the way through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the whole exactly. thing. And I'm, now I'm watching it again and I'm sharing it. I'm <laughs> really, I was like, oh, I can't wait for the haters to share it. And, like, and then and I'm going to watch it did, one more time. Someone just, I saw a share and it just said like, no. <laughs> I shared it in a Van Halen group because that's like something I'll do on Facebook. And they just shit. Every comment was like, this is fucking horrible. <laughs> Okay, well, I thought my David Lee Roth jump kicks were pretty good. I thought they were good. I couldn't believe my fat ass could get that up up in the air, man. I was, I saw that. I was like, man, I hope he didn't pull anything. Oh, dude, I almost broke my, (laughs) the very first one I did before we shot two days. The first one was me walking around in the street and, and all the ancillary stuff. And the next time we went and shot at the bar and where I did the ones there that were actually look good. But that first one I did was off these steps and I landed. I was like, oh my God, I am almost like felt like my ankles and knees just blew out. I was just like, okay, no more of this shit. Because I jumped off like three. And that one's hilarious too because you can just tell like, I get like no fucking gravity, man. Or no, you know. No air. I'm just like. But anyway, this, I'm not here to talk about that video. We, we, Wait, before we you, started. You should- you should have, uh, you should have like kept that in the video, and you're standing up, going Jesus, <laughs> yeah, like hobbling around. It should be me in the next video, just laying on the ground right there. Yeah, but, yeah there, there was that episode of The Office where that one dude does the splits, and he 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 oh, lands Andy. in the splits. In the, yeah, yeah, Andy, yeah. right, and Tore his keys stick in his nutsack. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it also made me think of that episode where he jumped, where they were the very beginning of it uh, in the intro. <laughs> They oh, were all parkour. parkour and they're like <laughs> jumped off it into a fucking box. That's right. Have you ever seen guy the uh, American office? Because I remember seeing the original when it was first airing, like whenever I came back over there. I'm not sure what year that was, early 2000s. Yeah, so I think when you were over, it was was it 2001 and then you came back over 2002. Yeah, and, and, maybe. and the office, the office was like I think pretty much brand new, a couple of years old. Totally, yeah, absolutely hilarious. Yes, it but still there was is only, if you, 
Was there only two seasons though of the original British one with with Ricky Gervais? Might have been two. Might have been two, possibly three. I don't don't know. They might have done two in a Christmas special, something like that. Mm. Yeah, and then I think it started here in like 2005. And I I was like... You all started off with the same script, right? It was kind of similar to to begin Mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. And then obviously then they took it and made it their own after that, yeah. Yeah. I remember having this attitude when it first came out here, like I was like the snobby guy that had already seen the English one. And I was like, whatever. (laughs) I don't work in an office. office shows i've already seen the real one and i for the longest time i didn't watch it and then i did and i just like got totally hooked on it and watched the whole thing and <laughs> cried when jim and pam you know had a kid and i just became a big sissy about it but no it's a great show i mean i, I both the english and the american versions are yeah I, well that's it's great because i know the american ones it was a huge show as well wasn't it it was huge i mean I think they some, did eight sometimes nine uh, sometimes they just it just doesn't work. Did you ever see the in between us? Yeah, when you came down here, we watched all those. Did we? I you introduced that. Oh, that was, yeah, dude. I probably had about fifteen pints of Jack and Coke or something. I can't well, the first time, yeah, the first time guy came down. So you came down here in 2012, and you had never been to Texas. We met in California in L.A. going to Musicians Institute. That's right. Fucking 20 years ago, and then I came over to England. Like that. that not long after that, when you went back, and uh, but you had never, and then I remember what still living out there, and you you came back out, and you were in Long Beach for a bit or something. And we hung out in L.A., and I came back to England, but then we didn't see each other for for you know ten years probably or something. Oh yeah, uh, well I think you're right. It was 2012, you, right? 2012, you came here, and that was, uh, that that's was hilarious. When at my old place, and and we just got blitzed. Like yeah, God. it was just well it was, that it was, was the, that was the time. I think that was yeah that was the first time you came here when you flew into Houston because it was cheaper and That's I went right. to pick you up in Houston I was still driving my Jeep in the motherfucker it was so hot and I had oh, no the- AC in that thing <laughs> for like 2 years and I used to drive around for work oh. all the time and I was just it was awful it was like a sweat box and I go pick up guy and he gets off the fucking plane coming from England and this is like what July or June, oh. you know, summer right <laughs> gets off the plane with black <laughs> yeah. trousers a black leather jacket or just and he's like Jesus Christ. in fucking Houston the most humid you know, armpit of you know Texas yeah because when I, when I left from England it was like pouring down with rain freezing yeah. cold so obviously big coat on black jeans all I got off the plane I was like oh Jesus Christ. It's a really bad idea. It was it was crazy, and that set the tone for the whole time. You were here for three weeks a month. It was wild, something right? like that. Yeah, and, uh, and so I remember, but that that set the tone because we were my, my big guy. <laughs> He steps off the plane. It's like 100 degrees in Houston. And immediately my car overheats. And I, it died in the middle of some big fucking you know, street. And so we're just like, Jesus Christ. So we're like, all right, let's just wow. go to a bar, let my car cool down. And we <laughs> went to a bar and just drank. And then like, not proud of this irresponsible behavior, drove back to Austin after hanging out at the bar once the sun went down. And then went uh. to Rob's studio, Mesa Recording Studios, and drank more. Like, I, I don't think you slept for 24 hours because you got on the plane, flew over here. We hit yeah. a bar in Houston. We went to Rob's studio, drank there, and probably got back to my place at 4 a.m. or something. I think I got like and, a like uh, major second wind. I think it's it's easy to do when you when you're at a new place. You can just you can just yeah. Uh, well, then you it. slept for like an entire. I think you literally slept through a day. <laughs> like, which is the same thing that happened. Remember when I the first time I came to England, I was so jet lagged and fucked up that like I remember like meeting your parents and they're you know, oh it's so great and I'm like falling asleep on the couch and they're I'm just so <laughs> like and they're like oh go to bed we'll see and then I woke up at like 4 a.m. pitch black in this place that I had no idea where anything was and I'm like oh, I've got a piss and I'm like knocking shit off the walls and <laughs> anyway we, there's plenty of good stories to get to about all that stuff but <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a a Mickey D story or something in there, right? Oh, dude, yeah. We that's got to be. Uh, when when should we bring out the McDonald's shit story guy? Because that's one of the greatest. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Few people that I know can rival John Simpson, the king of shit stories. But guy, guy can do it. And that, but here's the thing about guys' stories, man. 
I've I've seen I've been there for some of like the Frank fart stuff. You know, there's certain <laughs> things I've been there for, so I know they're I know they're true. But there's some stories that you told in the past where I'm just like, and I would retell the story, and people are like, there's no way that's true, and I'm like, I know. <laughs> But, but guys, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about your the way you tell stories. But I, I'm just like I believe it, and it's. But it's, it's, it's they're insane. There's something about UK bands, like like the club bands, especially. They've always got these insane stories. Well, wasn't it? You had some uh, some guys that you knew that were in a in a band. Where what was the one about? Uh, <laughs> two guys, two guys driving back from. <laughs> yeah, they were like, from him. <laughs> they were driving back from uh, work, Workington or somewhere. It's on the other on the other coast. <laughs> driving back in the middle of the night, and uh, obviously it's like you know three o'clock in the morning or something. No other traffic, so they're just like driving on the on the road like this. You know the two cars. One of them decide, and it, it, I, I suppose it is true. I like it's, it's, <laughs> one of them says. To the driver, the, the, guy, the lad in the passenger seat says, I've got a great idea. <laughs> I'm just laughing because I already know how this goes. <laughs> He's like, I've got a great idea. I'm going to shit in my hand, ro- roll it into a ball, and then I'm going to throw it in their car. <laughs> so that's what he does. And then he, so then he's going, he's going... Why wind the window down? What? Wind the window down? What? Wind the window down? All right, and then say, like, <laughs> like, oh. all hell broke loose. Like the lad was like mega pissed off, <laughs> as you can imagine. It was in his mouth and everything. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude! Uh, <laughs> now, Skunk, weren't you weren't you talking about a <clears throat> when Rudy was on? You were talking about delivering something, and you had a you went up to the girl. You were trying to talk to this girl or something, yes. and I think you said guy was in the car. Yes, oh, dude, we had, yeah, we had we had Rudy on a while back, man, and, and uh, All right. I highly I highly recommend for everyone to listen to the end of the John Simpson podcast and the end of the Rudy Cervantes podcast because those are two of the funniest shit stories I've ever heard in my life <laughs> but um man yeah Rudy Rudy came out with a a real zinger of a shit story it was and you know Rudy I mean it's it's definitely believable but um yeah we used to, when you were down that was when I was in college station with my parents and you came down I so said you had been to Texas I forgot about that duh and then you oh, came right. down and yeah I was in 2004 I remember because uh shit that was right before i moved to austin then because or it might, it might have been 2003 two or three yeah, maybe somewhere. i yeah for some like reason that. i was i was thinking the blessed hell ride had just come out and that that's was right because we had that on the car yeah but it didn't yeah. seem like it was that late maybe it was 2003 i don't know anyway <laughs> great because i think you bought that album and then that that same night decided you were going to do it at a busker's night <laughs> You'd like the, the song do the what? Hell Ride. Do you remember oh, that? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You'd learned it like five minutes before you did the guitar, and then you just sort of went, <laughs> there was like no words or anything. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how I roll. Hey, let's play this song that nobody knows right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. But man, like, so you, that's right, because every night you would roll with me, we were doing that paper route. And I remember getting uh, my old, who was my roommate when I moved to Austin, um, and that was like, we were kind of waiting we were planning moving to Austin. The guy that I lived here with when I first moved here, he used to cover that route for me because it was, you know, seven nights a week. And remember we drove, golly, man, we drove, I mean, it was 2003 because Hostile Groove was on tour. So oh, yeah, because we went up to we Dallas. Drove to, no, we drove, to San, we drove to San Antonio. We saw him in maybe even a couple. No, we went to saw him in Houston and then we went to San Antonio and hung out oh, with right, my friends. Okay, I hope. Chris and yeah 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 I, I remember that too and uh and they because they were on tour and um but anyway uh, you know the rest of the time every night we went and did that paper route and <laughs> we listened to a bunch of fucking cartoon themes and tv themes and <laughs> he just, man <laughs> he yeah just ridiculous shit uh and just laugh laughing around remember that time dude like Rudy left a roach in my car for that was in there for like months and I never knew about it 
I don't like he's, think we, so, I guess though. we smoked a joint or something, and he just left it in, in my back seat. <laughs> and I was oh, like right. cleaning out my car like months later. I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm just driving around with a roach in my car. Yeah, dude. Oh man, I, that's so crazy. Like, because we had talked to him and I, I was like, oh yeah, guy was there. Um, yeah, because it was it was great. I mean, it was like right in the middle of the night, but we'd just be blasting Black Label Society and all sorts of stuff. And and speaking of the open mics, right? Because we talked to him about that. That place, Salty Dog, was killer. I mean, they had a huge crowd. That place used to, it was like the place to be on Tuesday night or whatever the hell it was. That's and right. so me and Rudy used to play up there. And then you and I like thoroughly disappointed everybody because there was this whole thing, a bunk amount, all the musicians and people were just like, Oh yeah, man, this dude guy's coming into town and fucking badass guitar player. And, and so what do we do? We go up there and play fucking Doogie Hauser theme and 90210 theme songs. <laughs> Beverly Hills 90210. Every, yeah, everyone was just like, what the <laughs> hell? A few people were probably like really into it. And, and, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it was funny though, wasn't it? That was great. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember we went to San Antonio and Chris Boyd was like, uh, man, you know, I hear all this hype about Guy and all this and that. And I, you know, wait to see you guys jam. And I walk in the room and you guys are playing fucking Beverly Hills 90210 theme song. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yep, that's how it goes. <laughs> Dude, there was someone that taught at MI that co-wrote that song or played that song that's right it was it was, Danny uh, Gill I think it was it was, it was Danny and, Gill and and one of the other teachers who had already left by the time we got there I'm, right I'm and the other guy sure. I think, yeah, yeah yeah and the other guy actually auditioned for Ozzy I think I remember reading about it and I was like whoa oh maybe it's like yeah. Ozzy <laughs> 90210 theme song <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He probably yeah. cro- crossed that off his resume when uh, <laughs> when he got the gig with Ozzy. What have you done before this? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Yeah, what are your... Uh, do you have anything we can listen to? <laughs> Nothing at all. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> what a representation at all. of your work. <sighs> Man, uh, so I always talk about you when it's like, well, two things. Great shit stories and then guitar playing. And not all, met, yeah. Now, do you recall the very first time we met? Uh, was it? Now, you were out there before me, so maybe I met you before I actually came there. I don't remember. Maybe it was when I was there. But it was in a, was it in a Brett Garson? Yeah. Open council that's jam? when I, I mean, I might have seen you about before that, but that was when we first actually met. It was like you and me and this kid called Kevin. Do you remember this kid called Kevin? Great fusion player. Yeah. And there yeah. might have been like one other person. I can't was remember. It, was, was Frank the other guy? Possibly. Maybe, yeah. Because I remember being in there with, and Frank would be in there a couple of times. In his, Brett, Beavis and, in his Beavis and Butthead, you know, attire. This dude wore like, picture like Beavis, the, the, the shorts and the high pulled up knee socks, but then with a Don Dock and fedora <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, his fashion sense was second to none. <laughs> but that might have been when we met Frank. I, I remember he was in a few of those too. Anyway, he didn't, what, he didn't have a... Who, uh, I think uh, we were playing uh, back into um, have a cigar. Oh yeah, I man! We always played Pink that, Floyd tunes. That was, uh, I think, that's what we were jamming over. It and was crazy because everyone yeah. was so different. I was just that's playing right. all like my bluesy licks, and back then I could barely hang with a key change. And and then you were just going, you know, <laughs> I was just going like, what in God's name? And then that dude Kevin with the fusion. I, everyone, what was so cool about that was everyone in that room was just like, holy shit, right? And I I was just like, oh, this is I can't even believe like how the caliber of these players. But everyone was super cool. Like, oh man, that was cool, you know, and super different styles and stuff. But um, those are those are fun, man. Like those were such good. I think some of the best memories of MI, you know. Yeah, that was that was Just fantastic. Those, I mean, Brett gyms. was uh, Brett was in like a, diff- a different league, but he was like so humble as well. So cool, yeah. So yeah, cool. and he was just like, what a, what a player though. He was, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's, he's absolutely. I mean, have you have you seen him play slide guitar? Uh, no, I'm he's sure like it's... an absolute genius of that as well. Like unbelievably good. Yeah, he never looks what he's playing either, does he? He was always like looking, like closing his eyes like this and. Never looked at the fretboard ever. Yeah. 
but he the thing is he, he would do this kind of like hybrid thing yeah and then you would you would say oh how would you do that he was he'd be like oh, i don't know mate <laughs> yeah dude to be honest like brett was um a, a f- amazing player I don't really think, I mean, it, a lot of it's on me because I didn't go in with like specific questions. I mean, I, I was just like way nowhere near where I am these days in terms of just my knowledge of music in general, I guess, you know. <clears throat> and um, but yeah, a lot of times we just talked about influences and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, but you're right. I would, you know, it, it'd be like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> just, <laughs> <laughs> just some awesome shit I'm doing. And I'm just going like, uh, uh, Okay. He was a stunning player. I mean, just absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize at the time that he was, he played on uh, You're the Voice, you know, uh, John Farnham. That, that's that's him on that. If you, if you ever see the video for You're the Voice, you see him on the video. Really? Yeah. Hey, am I wrong or was he on, like, was there a Planet X album before? Um... Yeah. He was on the first one, I think. And it was, uh, what was the one? There was, I remember Moon Babies. And what was the one before that? Was it just called Planet X or Universe? Was that the title? That was it. it. Universe, yeah. that's right. Yeah. That was really cool. I really like both those albums, but I used, to, I used to listen to that one a lot. And then there was, you had like an old whatever with him on there, I think. I think it was. That was before that, wasn't it? I think it, it was, was co- I think it was, was it not actually a Derek Sherinian I, album? And the album maybe. was called Planet X. Ah, maybe. And then he adopted that as the band name moving forward and he got McAlpine and, and stuff like yeah. that. Well, do you know, is it, was any of those other guys on that original one? Do you know? Like, was Virgil Donati on there? Or? I honestly don't know. Possibly. I, I mean, back, I, back then, you just couldn't stop listening to Nitro. Was That's <laughs> yeah, the only right. thing you would <laughs> wanted to hear over and over again. <laughs> Dude, one Free of the greatest train. one of the greatest fuck-ups of all time. Like, did you not have that EP and gave it away, right? I had the, or do you uh, still the, have it? The, the second hot, album, hot, hot, uh, hot, wet, dripping with sweat. Right? I've got, I've still got that somewhere. It, <laughs> oh, it's not do. like it's not in my main CD collection. Obviously, it's like hidden in a little vault. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's buried in the backyard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> but it's just hilarious. <laughs> uh, that now was it? You that told me? Oh man, some of the greatest. Fo- I mean, the the music is second to none in terms of just horribly wonderful like just everything about it the playing the production the melodies is just atrocious but but you can't get enough of it freight train the video is one of the greatest videos of all time and just lacking every single aspect of melody or musical (laughs) taste you could ever fathom um but also the, the album picture or the back you know i just remember and all they had all these great names like there was jim gillette michelangelo what were the other guy? And one guy was just a nothing but chest hair and sunglasses. You know, I like think there was the, the, one of them was called like TJ Racer or something like that, and his hair <laughs> was like literally fifteen feet high. You know, <laughs> and, and was it you that told me? Was it Jim Gillette? Was Ron Jeremy's roommate? And that's where the title came from. Is that accurate? Or did I, I didn't know about that? I didn't know about that at all. That's the first I've heard of that. Okay, maybe maybe I. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I really want to go research that, but I feel like somebody <laughs> told me you. This is what I think about Guy, though. I think what you do is make shit up. Because no, I remember, you, yeah, you think well, about Ron Jeremy when you think about Guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, right. So, There's but no, because there was somewhere. one time with with one of your stories where I was like, "Oh, in this story," and you're like, "No, that's not that. I, I don't remember that." And I'm like, "I swear you told me that." So either I've got like major dementia. <laughs> and I'm just creating, false, you know, schizophrenic scenarios, or you're changing your tune, sir. <laughs> I don't know. I, think I, I might be guilty of telling a story and forgetting it. You know? All right. I remember. Okay. So obviously there was the one about the shit throwing. That's, you confirmed that one. We'll get to that. That's, that's, story, that's true. Yeah. Apparently, the best that, apparently that is true. But then there was one about a guy. There was one about a guy who was staying at a friend's house and he, he was super horny and he opened the refrigerator. Is any of this ringing a bell? Oh, God, yeah. Hang on. Gee, I, that, I mean, 
Is that when he got the chicken? <laughs> <laughs> that can't be true. This is the kind of things a guy says, and you're just like, that cannot be true. And somehow he convinces you it's true. Yes. <laughs> apparently. Apparently it's true. <laughs> who are these who are these friends of yours? Like how, who was this chicken fucker? I think this is well, it's definitely a guy an fucked a raw chicken. And then I think he just put it back. He just put it back in the oh. <laughs> Well then there was the guy. We will get to actual music and stuff uh, in this podcast, but I mean I knew this was how this was gonna turn out. Like, then there was the guy. This is another one. Was there not a guy who this is just terrible, but had had relations with his friend's mom? No, no, there was a one 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 way or another a guy who who uh put his dick where he shouldn't have and got an infection. <laughs> right? Is this another one? Maybe, I don't know. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is what happened. I spent time with Guy. Could have learned valuable musical stuff, but no. This is what I took back from it. Just stories that 20 years later, Guy's like, oh. uh, Jesus. But I remember, dude, when I first came over there recording back then, like to me, I had a little Fostex, Fostex four track tape thing. Oh, yeah. That used right, a little yeah. bit. Uh, you had the whole the eight at uh, Alesis eight at two machines, and I was in a cool band that little Alan Heath board, and I was just like the SR sixteen, you know, and that was like, whoa, you know, that was super cool. And I remember uh, just recording a bunch of weird nonsense, but you had like actual songs, you know, sort of good, you know, guitar melodic type songs and stuff. Are those anywhere nowadays? Can like people go find those? Are they are they uh, online anywhere? I, I, the, the, do you know what it is? The probably the last time they were uploaded was on MySpace. Wow, you <laughs> should put those out, man! Like you yeah, should put them at least on SoundCloud. They're great. They're great songs. Yeah, <clears throat> I was thinking about maybe re-recording some of them, you know, because uh, yeah. the, the the quality is a bit lousy on some. Never listen back to them now, you know. So possibly. Re- yeah, I mean, we didn't know what we do. I, I remember doing stuff back then with the first time. I don't think it was that trip. Maybe next time you had like Logic and. We oh, that's right. That would, yeah, that made it a little and bit so easier to do. I used to do. I would record not up to uh, nitro standards. Never up to nitro <laughs> standards. That's an impossibility. <laughs> Didn't use the uh, the the four neck guitar there. Yeah, would have done can, a hard uh, one. <laughs> few can. Uh, that's the the, the trade off, I guess. To play a four neck guitar, you have to you have to put so much time into the technique of learning to do that that than any sort of melodic. Uh, ability. Now, here's the thing. I hate to talk shit about Michelangelo because he's he is like a, a really nice guy. He just seems like a really cool dude, and he's great at what he does. He's, a f- I mean, no one else can do that. Guy's an actual freak. But, and I think that's his thing. He's just like whatever. I'm not here to like create beautiful, you know, singing David Gilmore melodies. <laughs> I'm here to <laughs> to play crazy technical shit and make people, you know, excited about it. Um, but what I was going to say was like back then, you know, it's like punching in on tape and you have to rewind. And I remember you would be doing solos and all this stuff. And I would just be like, wow, cool. And you're like, mm, nah, throw it away. I'm just like, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Throw it a shit. You hit like one bad note. No one but like, but you know, when you're playing, like you can tell, right. And the person yeah. listening a lot of times when you're, you know, list, someone's listening and they're like, ah, it's amazing. You're like, nah, I didn't feel good. I know I shanked some stuff in there. But I, that was back when it was like not recoverable, you know. It wasn't like oh, yeah, oh, let's do a bunch of playlists, and I'm just going like, ah, oh, all right, we'll record over it. Fuck, you know. Yeah, we'd have to just, just have to read. That, it was so difficult, wasn't it? You had to just do complete takes. Yeah, because we we couldn't get the punch ins because it was so difficult to punch in, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. Yeah, you'd have to do long sections. You couldn't just do like I'm just gonna ha- I'm just gonna get this measure and this lick. It was like yep, do the whole solo again. You know, I heard and stories then I remember, that like, uh, like I heard stories that like in back in the day they would hire people who were like masters at like punching in like for one note. Really? Like, apparently, like like Mutt Lang had this bloke working for him, and it would, he would just go and he would like <laughs> punch in, punch out in like the exact right spot. You know? Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was like an art back then, man. You cut and tape, and there was no room for error. There was no Command Z, like you. 
if you fucked up something, oops. I, I was reading about um, Pink Floyd. I think it was uh, the song Shine On You Crazy Diamond. They had tracked a whole bunch of shit. And then they found out, discovered that um, there was some kind of bleed or re there was something had gotten tracked that wasn't supposed to be there. And they just had to scrap it and start over. Oh. You know? Uh, yeah. Crazy, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. <clears throat> But I remember Logic doing those first and being like, oh, I'm going to double, tra you know, I, I can remember just tracking and then just like copying and pasting. It's like, no, that's not double tracking. That doesn't actually <laughs> just do makes it, thing. Just makes it louder. <laughs> now I've got them panned and it's just really loud in the center. But yeah. Just like no idea what, what you know, of yeah. anything back then. And basically I'm still the same, but um, <laughs> man, just I mean, you Pro Tools now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just with pro, but but you've done a lot over the years, and you're real meticulous, both as a player and a, you know, we're both I think perfectionistic or can be, and I'm a very yeah. all or none. I can just shit something out and be like, woo. But if, but then it's almost it's hard. And if I start diving into it, then I want to fuck with every. And I know you're like that. Yeah, fuck with every EQ and compressor and yeah. all this kind of shit. And and then you just kind of can very easily beat something to death. And um, I think the best thing to do is. To have like a, a deadline, yeah, you have you know, to. When we had like the when the Blitzkrieg album, it was like it's got to be done for this time, you know. I was like, shit. Yeah, and you, then you just have to. In, in Germany, right? Let's. You were in Blitzkrieg. For anyone who doesn't know, Blitzkrieg was man, shit, man. They were they around? I guess all the way back in the seventies, even because they influenced Metallica. Metallica covered that title uh, track. Yeah, in I think maybe some, oh, I'll probably get corrected from Brian if he say this, but I think it was about 1980 when mm -hmm. they released like an EP and it had Blitzkrieg on it and uh, Buried Alive and, and something else, I think. So I think that's about 1980. However, I could be wrong on the exact date. And are they or are they out of Germany? No, uh, they're from Leicester in the UK. Really? Okay. Yeah. And so Some, when you... Uh, Started playing with them. That was two thousand four, or what? What year was that? Two thousand six, I think six. it was. I, I went in. They, they just recorded an album, and the guitar player decided uh, to leave the band. Uh, and they and they, they started. They, they were, must have been doing scouting around the area, and they, they turned up at a gig once, or, or two of them did. And asked us to join. I thought, oh, I'll have a think about it and everything. And anyway, the next thing I, I knew, they were getting in touch and saying, look, we've got a, a tour with Saxon, a UK tour with Saxon. So I was like, well, I, I have to do it, you know? It's like you just have to do that sort of thing, you know? So so we did that tour. Then we did a tour with, do you know, have you heard of Doro? You know, Doro Pesh? She was in Warlock. Oh, okay. I know. Yeah, Warlock, she's, yeah. Uh, so and we did a tour with, with her band a bit later in the same year. And then 2007, we did the Theatre of the Damned album in uh, in Germany. And you played, what was the year you played the, the Wacken Festival? That was that was 2007. Seems like a lifetime ago now, but yeah, yeah 2007. Yeah. Well, I remember when you joined and I was just like, holy shit, you know, like that was fucking awesome, man. And you played big ass festivals and I mean, that was yeah, a was, pretty huge was, crowd, you know. Oh, it was, it was, it was awesome. Like honestly, just unbelievable experience you know and then that so album uh, how uh how fast did you i mean you just went in and tracked everything in a couple of days or what we let's let's how do we do it i think we had 10 days all together but that was including getting like the, the mix going as well so we did if i remember rightly uh, myself and the drummer went out first and he he did his drums. I think I think they did the drums in a couple of days. Um, I took over because I demoed possibly about three quarters of the album was demoed, or even more than that. So I'd taken over like lots of like uh, keyboard parts and stuff, like MIDI stuff, and we just like uh, imported that straight in, essentially, just to save some time. Put that straight in. Um, can't remember i mean i did all the guitar solos in one one afternoon <laughs> it was like literally like almost one take for everything mm -hmm. uh, which is like absolutely not the way i like to work but just on the on the timer the entire time what's was, uh 
were you guys tracking that to tape or was that digital? That no, it was in the logic. It was in the, the logic. logic, yeah. Um it was funny because the the studio was at the at the very top of a derelict uh car park, like a multi-story car park. So it was just completely abandoned, apart from this bit at the top that he has that had it as a um, recording studio. So we actually did the photo shoot for the album. If you if you ever see any of the photos from that time, mm-hmm. we just like went down into the uh, into other parts of the car park and stuff like that. There was a, there was like kind of like office parts and stuff as well, like and uh, all all just abandoned, you know. Where was that? What city? Uh. Jesus, was it Hamburg? Hamburg, it was. It was Hamburg, yeah. And uh, yeah, but I, I think like say the, the guitar rhythm guitars were done in a day, and then the solos were done one like one afternoon essentially, from what I recall. Um, the, uh, Brian did his vocals very quickly. Brian like. Uh, to his credit double tracks everything mm-hmm. but his timing's always perfect like all the tails of the notes are exactly right and everything because yeah. we were like cause the, the producer was going oh, I'll have to line everything up and he was like oh I don't have to it was just like <laughs> he just did it you know he just he just did it was know? the producer engineer the same guy or were the two different dudes it was the, it was the one guy. He, he had like an assistant who came in uh, here and there to do, to do some of the uh, sort of like a bit of a drum replacement stuff, like that, say a bit of time and things. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it was one. It was essentially one guy. It, it might have gone off someone else to get mastered. I can't remember precisely. We we we'd come back before it went to get mastered because I, I remember they sent us a few a few examples of because uh, I remember like they sent two different masters and they're like which one do you like the best and i was like well they, they sound exactly the same to me <laughs> i like the first one but they sounded exactly the same <laughs> dude i know i've had that too where someone's like here here's the master and here's another one that's like a db what you know there's like one little and i'm like i can't fucking tell like yeah, just exactly the same. make up but you, make the but choice you dare to say you dare to say are you sure you've not just said the same one so you just go i like the first one the best <laughs> But I also think like, yeah, I think sometimes guys will fuck with you too. Like I, I feel like right, especially like live sound guys are like, oh, can you do the little of this and a little of that? And they're like, yeah. And they don't do anything. Yeah. And then you're like. <laughs> 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 Fucking well, asshole. Well, that thing yeah, as well sure, with the. Uh, move your fader up, you dick. The DFA channel, isn't it? Uh, the, the DFA fader. It's like when, when you get the sound guy at a, a venue and someone is always like a, a punter coming over pissed with his pain going, oh, turn the. Turn the vocal a little bit so you, the, oh, the guy just yeah. goes, just moves this channel up. Is that better? Oh, much better. But it's actually right, a channel. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually got DFA written on does fuck all. <laughs> you know? It's not even connected to anything. Oh, much better, much better. Nothing's changed. <laughs> right. Well, I've seen that too. And there's times, even just today, I had like, I was going through some tracks and I was a playlist and I was like doing an edit on something and I'm like playing it back and listening. I'm like, wow, those really sound exactly the same. And I'm like sitting there making this edit and I'm like, and then I look and I've got like the wrong like oh, track solo. I'm like, happens. oh, Jesus Christ, you know? Like, that happens. And, uh, but dude, like, and sometimes like people, you'll be, have you ever like, you'll, you're sitting there fucking with a compressor and EQ and then you're like, oh, for fuck's sake, it's bypassed. You know what I mean? And like, you're, <laughs> you're sitting there like trying to hear shit and you're like, I, I fucking suck. <laughs> I think that happens think it, all the time. And I know like Rob's done that with like, there was this fucking idiot who was out at the studio years back and he was like uh, trying to do something and and Rob just like disengaged to the EQ and the guy's all on the board like, that's better. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, it, good you, job. You, you good just job. convince yourself, yeah. Right. But I mean, yeah, I, I, like, it, it happens to everybody. So I saw something with uh, like an interview with Andy Sneap not so long ago and he said he's done that before. Yeah. You know, he's sitting like, EQ and something it's like oh yeah and then it's like but it's bypassed you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah I feel like guys I, I bet you the engineers will do that with musicians if you're in a situation where like some guys oh can I have a mess with that you're like yeah sure and then just let them turn some knobs so they feel like they're doing something and be like yeah yeah good. it's really great yeah. <laughs> sounds you can much imagine better it, like, can I have a go that oh geez if you must <laughs> uh, it's gotta be the worst right to just be like 
Yeah, because well, you've got to be some kind of doing. giant dick if you if you've got like Andy Sleep producer and you, and you ask if you can have a go. Can I have a go at mixing that? Why? <laughs> no. Well, I have. Uh, yeah, I've certainly uh, gotten under some skin and pissed off a few people. I'm sure that from my <laughs> anal tendencies, well, like Quincy Jones and stuff like that. Quincy. Can I have a- <laughs> Not quite Quincy Jones, but yeah, right. Like exactly, exactly. Hey. I, I, it's like remember that dude at MI, uh, 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 hey, uh, Fred. It was like uh, uh, Quincy. Uh, can you uh, remember there was that we had that theory class and there was that one guy who oh, didn't Jesus. understand anything and the guy would like be like, so a major scale is this and like and then the class would just be like, and then he'd be like, uh, you're like, dude, yeah, why you were just you waiting here? for it. He would he would sometimes like ask a question that the teacher had just said. So right, he just said it. <laughs> Are you not listening? <laughs> it was that was a weird dynamic of people that were like guru status, and then some that were just like, "Wow, you should not be here at all." Like, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was there was a few, wasn't there? So I, loved, I think like, I think some of them would do like the recording side of it, so that they weren't particularly well, awesome that's, at playing. Yeah, but, and you got those guys that want to be engineers and producers, and not to say that it can't be a thing, but. Nine times out of ten, you know, or nine point nine times out of ten, I, you need to be a musician. You need to understand the language of music. You need to understand intervals, and yeah. you've got to be able to communicate. You got to know what you're hearing. You have to understand meters. You don't necessarily have to play anything proficiently, but you should understand the piano. You should be able to play because a good producer can usually get behind any instrument and at least convey an idea, right? I think you'd have to because you'd need to understand how that instrument's going to be best in the mix and things like that as well. Yeah, I feel like people that are just like, I want to be an audio engineer. Some a lot of times they'll get into that world and just be like a deer in headlights because all of a sudden they're like, we're learning music theory and just going like, oh my god, I have no idea what's going <laughs> on, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's definitely, a, I think, a, a logical progression there, which maybe they teach some of that. Well, they'd have to in any kind of audio engineering stuff. But um, did you ever do that trick when you when you'd be mixing like late at night and you were like, it's like two o'clock in the morning or something, you're like EQ in a snare, right? And it's like perfect, absolutely perfect. Like, right, I'm going to go to bed now. Next morning, you pour on, it's like, what the fuck is that? Sounds sounds like Saint Anger. Oh man, dude. <laughs> I mean, I've, I I've been doing more and more lately, where I'm actually like kind of trying to sort of mix a little bit. And I, you know, I finally got some bundled plug-in stuff that's like pretty good, you know, or it is good, and not just the stock stuff that. But I, I, you know, and some of it, I'm still like. uh it's okay. It's not great, but I'm like really a B and trying to figure things out and really dicking around with stuff. But I listen to like, yeah, some of the stuff I've done where you're like for hours and hours and days, just fucking around with shit. And then you go back and listen to it. Like this is a fucking complete pile of shit. Oh, like, yeah. This is just absolute garbage. I'm like, I can't like, believe I'm... I was like, here, listen to my mix, you know, <laughs> it's like, if I put it in the car, it's like, Oh Jesus Christ. So if you put it in the car, it never works. Is it? <laughs> That's the thing too. Like, I think that's a big thing. Is you need to like, and I'm pretty lazy. I mean, I don't. Even, I just got a CD burner for fuck's sake because nothing has that anymore. Just so I can be like, I can reference it on an old boombox. You should reference it in your car, a boombox, and a phone, and a laptop, and you know, like four or five different places rather than just because if you're just blaring something through. And I also have a bad habit about mixing in headphones, which I know is not typically a recommended idea. Cause yeah, you'll do a lot okay of things. It's okay for some of the time, right? It's okay if you want I, to make sure your bass levels are right and stuff. Well, also it bothers me like that a lot of guys never use headphones at all. Like I would be like, I would at least want to reference. Like if I was mixing through, you know, you got your mains and your nears, and, but also like I would want to at least reference and be like, how does this sound in my head, in a head, pair of headphones? How yeah. does it sound in my Bluetooth, you know, earbuds? How does it sound? There's like there's some software come out where it actually. Uh, Mimics. emulates yeah exactly it emulates like all like like old 80s ghetto blaster something headphones car speakers and you can just go through them all it's oh, apparently wow. really good i can't remember what it's called but apparently there is something out there like that now you know but uh i think the best thing to do is uh which i do you know do you know jens borgen have you heard of him before swedish producer do like symphony x and um, oh sure yeah bands okay. like this you know uh, Opeth things like that right and uh, oh, yeah. he, he did a video and he was like saying like just don't mix 
in solo mode. It's like you just go, you just go up your own arse. You do, like try as soon as you can, like just mix everything in a context, like just all played at the same time. You know, he said, right, I don't think go he, through he, instrument by instrument. No, and he said, and, and, unless you have like you can hear like an issue, you might want to solo to kind of get rid of a certain frequency. Mm-hmm. But like he said, you know, if you like solo the bass guitar, I mean, you, you know, this happens. You know, if you solo a bass guitar. And then you you like EQing it, right? Perfect. And you put it back in the mix. You're guaranteed to have it too loud. Yeah, absolutely. Because your ears so used to wanting to hear it. Yeah. So you're like, save it, right? Save, perfect. Come back ten minutes later. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I definitely mix uh, bass too loud, and uh, I don't know. I mean, it's there's probably different there's different schools of thought, but that's the it, that's the problem. It's you're right. You can just go down a rabbit hole endlessly. That's why yeah. I like when I'm creating something. It's just like, all right. And I've gotten that with timing now, too. It's like there's the advantage to all the technology, but the disadvantage, because now when I record, I'll sit there and I'm looking at everything going like, ooh, I'm a 64th note ahead. And it's like <laughs> bugging me. And I'm like fucking with everything. And no one's ever going to notice unless you actually notice it. Like there are times when you kind of do notice, but like so many times, like, but I mean, a lot of guys, that's what you do nowadays, right? Especially in like super pop, super polished pop country metal right precision yeah. metal it's like things are grid they're fucking precise it's but the thing like is it's like Sabbath days have you not found this because like yeah i've been guilty of that in the past where you know you're like punching on, on a guitar solo i'm not happy with that and then it, it, it gets released anyway and, and you listen back like years later and it's like, well, oh, that sounds fine. It's, it's, and you can't remember where you you can't remember where you punched in. Yeah, yeah. Anything like that? Where was the dodgy note? That's gone. I think it's just you get so obsessed at the time, and then once you let it sort of lie for a couple of years, you can just go, ah, oh, that's that's actually not too bad. You know? And you got to really remember the biggest thing. I think and this is, I think that what is important about it, if a good producer will will make this, will pay pay attention to what's really important, like. Is everything working together in time, grooving, or the, is the melody solid? Is the vocal sound, you know, like yeah. who gives a shit about a one dB difference with a little bit of EQ on your little arpeggio? Right. I mean, we do, but in the grand scheme of the song, if like, if you, if that's like perfect, but you've got an out of tune vocal, who gives a shit, right? Like, yeah, exactly. that's the, that's what needs to be, you know, so. I mean, most people, you know, this, like, you could spend like, weeks trying to get a mix perfect and then like oh check out my song and they listen on the phone oh right. yeah it sounds pretty yeah it's, that's cool that's it like and then what do you think the guitar solo oh there was a guitar solo was there it's right like, yeah. yes the fucking was yeah they're not gonna listen <laughs> you, to it anyway. you've spent all yeah. that time getting your kick and your bass sounding <laughs> immense you can't even hear it <laughs> it's like that uh last guns and roses album you never knew when it was coming out and it's like oh chinese democracy you worked on it for like how long that's right yeah yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't I'm even think I've listened to that entire album. Honestly, it's, like, it's, it's not bad. I think it's quite good. I think it's Buckethead is awesome. Overproduced. Oh, man, well, Ron, yeah. So I guess Buckethead is the player. I don't know if Ron Thal's playing on that album or he was just the live guy in that band. Yeah, Buckethead is, well, I, you know what bothers me about, I feel like I've always had good sensibility in these things. And like, I think their choice of singles was terrible. Like, the, they're not bad songs. But hands down, 1,000%, I would have made the single on that album. Uh, I think it's the fifth track. It's called uh, If the World. That is just a oh, fucking a amazing song. song. Yeah. Amazing song. The vocal melody is brilliant. It's, it's just beautiful. Buckethead's guitar solo is fucking amazing. I, it's oh, just a great I know which one you mean. You know what I mean? It's, 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 a radio, it's a good song. And a lot of the songs on that album are like, you know, with Axel, like, everything's got like 5,000, you know, vocal harmonies and very, and they're sweet picking through verses. I mean, it's almost like he was trying, I, I don't know. I just feel like it was, everything was so grand. I, think I don't, it, it, I don't dislike the album. I still like it, but I think a lot of it is just too epic all the time. You know what I mean? I think he just lost it. If you spend that long on something, you're just, you're going to lose sight on what's, what's, what it's supposed to be. You know, if you, if you, I mean, how long did it take? Did it take about seven years to do or something like that? <clears throat> yeah. If you start like, you know, day one, seven years earlier, you're not you're not even the same person as you're gonna be. So mm-hmm. how you how so the album's gonna mutate and change and you're gonna go back and go, Oh, I need to change that from the start now because I want it like this now. So you end up just having something that's probably a bit 
hit and miss bit all over the shop, you know. Yeah. And, the, and the other thing is with that sort of thing is if you if you if you get if you're a fan and you're waiting that long for something to come out, it's never ever going to meet your expectation. Never. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, it at the end of the day, it's just an album. You know, it's and people are expecting well, you, this like absolute masterpiece. And also, once you get to a certain point as a band, like once you've done, I mean, shit, Appetite for Destruction. But let's say the Use Your Illusion albums, or once Metallica did the Black album, or once Megadeth did Youth, and you're never gonna please. You're never gonna be able to get, get there again. Like you can still put uh, out goods. I think Megadeth is almost never, never. Uh, let down. I like every Megadeth album for the most part. And they're all, you know, some oh, of them are yeah, more poppy, so, some I mean, like, as fuck. But Metallica has just had some of the most yeah. atro- atrocious recordings of all time. They're still super, super huge and relevant. It's weird how the the dichotomy there. But like, yeah, I feel like you're you just you're never gonna live up to that. You'll never hit that pinnacle again, right? And so Yeah. Why you can't, like the, the, yeah, and you just can't please all the fans of the band wants to move on. But half the fans want uh want them to keep making the same album over and over and over again you know and that's always the case and the only band that i think does that and actually works is acdc i don't yeah. want that from any other acdc it's like it's cool right but any other band does it you're just kind of like i remember like most of my favorite bands every time they put an album out i think metallica is the exception because they they've truly put out unlistenable music but um <laughs> but they also have some of the greatest music ever you know in rock metal ever, done, oh, ever yeah. written so i mean hey, of course so it's that's they're kind of an interesting band in my opinion in that way. But but like I feel like and make it us a little more like ACDC, like you know what you're gonna get in the style of it for the most part. They're different, the albums are different, but it's not like that, you know, super di- but bands like Faith No More and Alice in Chains and stuff like that, like every time they put out an album, I would be like, Whoa, because it was just way different than what yeah. I had and so it was almost like you kind of didn't like it at first, but then you loved it. It grew on you, and it was like, wow, they evolved, and they did all these different things. And yeah. So I think a lot of my favorite albums ends up being those ones that kind of jolt you at first, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, Stephen Wilson does that yeah. every, single, every single album. It's like, whoa, what's happened now? But yeah, And you just get into it, you know? It, it's, yeah. And that's great. But yeah, like, it's, see, what you, as you said, you're right. You would never get AC, DC ever. You just I mean, ACDC I mean, did like one song in three, four, huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> ACDC comes imagine. out with like a, a track in five, four with like organs and shit. It'd just be like people would be fucking losing their minds. <laughs> <laughs> it's got like a like a, a flute solo and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the Invincible Czar is now. You're making me think we should cover an ACDC song. I would. Oh. People would be so disgusted with it. Like, how dare oh, you? you? Should you how have a flute player? Like, yeah. Oh, man, that's yeah, that would be like tremendous. <laughs> um, man, so I started talking. You know, we started before we started recording. We were briefly talking about Van Halen and you know passing away soon. Although he, you know, he had years of health problems. Uh, I guess cancer from smoking. I'm, I'm assuming then, there was a thing about him talking about how there was. He thought it had to do with his picks. Yeah, have you heard that? Right. He, he used. Did he say he had a metal? pick and yeah. it caused some kind of mouth. I don't know what it what it was some kind of energy thing like, within his studio or so I don't know what what it was he had mouth or tongue cancer or throat cancer I think, throat he, had cancer, I think. he had he had a third of his tongue removed like 15 oh. years earlier didn't he something like that yeah it was I remember hearing about that it was quite a while ago when the yeah. first cancer diagnosis came out but obviously his passing was was huge you know in the oh, music community and unbelievable inspired uh, Josh from the Invincible Czars to do what we're doing currently. But I I went back and Josh was always this huge Eddie Van Halen fan. Van you are obviously Tim from Ernest yeah. all you know, all these guitar player friends of mine, all. And shamefully, not that I don't respect Eddie Van Halen and wasn't influenced and blown away by his playing, but I just never, Van Halen was never a band that I went and listened through their whole catalog and got into everything and knew everything about it and learned all this stuff. I mean, like I did with Metallica or something, but like, uh, man, there, there's a lot of great songs and it's kind of grown oh, on yeah. a lot of the old David Lee Roth stuff has grown up because David Lee Roth's just such a dork, you know, like I think, uh, the, <laughs> you know, just kind of the, the, uh, oh my God, someone had a comment in there about D- David Lee Roth's going to kick someone's ass. I was like, oh man, I would love to fight David Lee Roth. That would be fun. <laughs> We just jump kicking <laughs> two fat asses. Jump kicking. <laughs> His wig I think falls he's off. like, a, isn't he like a, 
like a martial arts expert in like five different martial arts or something. Oh, is he one of those Elvis guys? Oh, maybe I don't know if I see David Lee Roth. Oh, shit. I think okay. he's like literally sort of like fourth Dan black belt karate and. All right, I, I know, retract that statement. I do not want to fight eighth David Dan Lee Roth. Jeet Kune Do and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what is your? Um, I mean, as a life, you know, I'm Eddie Van Halen is one of your biggest influences, not if not your biggest influence, right? Well, I mean, that, that was it, it was him that. I was like, when I first saw him, I was like, I want to play the guitar because I'd mm-hmm. seen him. So, yeah, he was like my initial sort of uh, massive influence. Yeah, for me, it was Slash was that uh, hearing appetite. And, and that was just like, I want to play guitar. But right, you right. and a million other people, you know, Eddie Van Halen. So what what is like some of your favorite uh, Van Halen albums and some of your favorite Eddie oh, moments? Honestly, it's extremely. Like I mean, the thing is with, with me is... It's a, it's a funny one because you know most people will, will always say that they they prefer the Roth years, you know. But I didn't I didn't actually hear Van Halen and, and apart but apart from possibly Jump, I didn't hear Van Halen until uh, about nineteen ninety, and 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 at that point, obviously, it was Sammy Hagar was the singer. So the first album I heard was Oh You Wait One Two. And then I heard fifty one fifty, so I, I was into the the Sammy Hagar stuff first. Those are pretty poppy albums, right? Very yeah, keyboard heavy, very I, poppy. Yeah, I still I still love them though. I mean, they could well do with a remastering like now, but uh, well, but they really brought it. Albums. And then the production, like every, they seem like they just upped their game on every level when For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge came out. The production, yeah, um, we got Andy it, Andy Johns then, didn't they? Man, dude, yeah, great songs and got, like. Uh, yeah, uh, Andy Johns on that one, and then Bruce Fairburn did uh, Balance, which is I think even better again. Oh wow! Day. Okay, uh, possibly I think that's. A I bit, didn't realize uh, he did that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, those and those were huge. Like they came. Not, I guess they were always big, you know. But I remember they were they were they were still huge in that early nineties. Well, I mean, 90s. every everything on that album every, was a hit. Yeah, every Sammy Hagar album went to number one, didn't it? All the Van Hagar ones. And then around the time I get, well, no, I guess it was the late 90s when that uh, Van Halen 3 came out and kind of flopped comparatively to the others. What are your, what's your take on that album? Uh, I mean, I'm a little bit biased because I, I do pretty much like all Van Halen, but I mean, it, it's, I think it's definitely the weakest album. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not even recorded very well. It doesn't sound sonically very good at all. There's a couple of tracks where you can actually hear it sounds like it's distorting because it's obviously like mixed too loud or something mm-hmm. like that. Or, but uh, and there's some good moments on there. Um, but it's certainly the weakest album. I, I, I don't love it, put it that way. <laughs> there's a couple, I mean, like Fire in the Holes, are like a great track. That could have, I think that could have been on like a, a Van Hagar album easily. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, it is the the odd couple of tracks of the rest of it, I'm not not so much into it, you know. Um, and I think that oh no, they did they did uh, different kind of truth later on, didn't they? With when they got Roth back, and that that was pretty good as well. Yeah, I haven't heard that. I saw that on Spotify. That those forget what year that was. Doesn't seem like I it was that long 20, ago. 2012 or something. Yeah, about about then. Because <clears throat> um, they really didn't do anything post that Gary Sharon album right i mean did they tour or do any the, i was the, lucky enough to finally see them on tour a few years ago you know with roth yeah the the, the t- i think apparently the tour for uh van halen 3 was like very successful really because they let they let gary sharon pick the the set list as far as i can tell so mm. he went back and they started doing like all of the old roth stuff like i'm the one and all that sort of stuff so i think apparently the the two was quite a success as far as I know but the album I think only shifted about well only shifted about 500,000 copies by today's standards that would be massive I would oh yeah but I think you know I think Balance did like 4 million or something like that Mm -hmm. did it I don't know Mm -hmm. it it was definitely in the million I'm sure those yeah those yeah all those are are major classic albums so so um, sorry go, go ahead I was going to say, I think they did start making a second album with uh, Gary Sharon. I'm sure they did several mm. tracks and then just got shelved. Mm. So obviously this wasn't working out, you know. And then obviously after that, they got they got 
Sammy Hagar back for that tour um, in early 2000s. And then sacked him? Or what was the deal with that? Um, I'm trying to think how that all went down. Was it him or Michael Anthony? One of them One of them got fired or quit, and so the other one did too. Or there was something weird about like Sammy Hagar was on vacation or someone was having a kid or something, and they're like, if you don't come here for this, you're fired or some crazy shit. I'm not sure, possibly. I I, I don't think, I tell you, because Michael Anthony was, well, he still is very good friends with Sammy Hagar, isn't he? Mm -hmm. So I think he was like hanging out with Sammy Hagar after after he'd been fired from the band. And I I don't think that went down too well in the the Van Halen camp, as far as I know. And then they started Chickenfoot, which was, that's probably been a good 10 years now, huh? Oh yeah, it's got to be. Did they do two or three albums? I can't remember. No, they've done at least two. Might I'd have three. Yeah, um, yeah. That album sounds great. Those are what I've heard. The first album. The, that was. The, I think the first one was Andy Johns again, wasn't it? I'm sure he did the first one. Um, what are uh, so? What are some of your other biggest influences, man? Um, well, I found out about a lot of guitar players from you that I had either just kind of heard of and hadn't heard, or guys I'd never heard of, like John Norum, who's phenomenal. Oh yeah, I know you're a big John Sykes guy, Paul Gilbert, Ingve. You got the yeah, yeah, you're hitting it. I mean, what happened with me? It was like it, it was Eddie Van Halen to start with, and uh, and then slowly but surely it was like yeah, see so these players like John Norum, and then and then I got into the shrapnel record stuff. Which obviously, Ingve was on the Steeler album, I think initially, and then uh, you had uh, Tony McAlpine, Vinnie Moore, Paul Gilbert, mm. all all those sort of players, Richie Cotson, Joey Tafoya, and all all, all those uh, players were just. Uh, I think I think there was a, a a phase of about two years where I'd only listened to instrumental guitar stuff. <laughs> I think you had a separate. I remember vaguely your seat you you had like these rows of cds and like there was a whole shelf of of just shrapnel like all instrumental <laughs> yeah. shrapnel stuff yeah yeah and i and burned they, like I mean, all your whole cd collection like a day oh, that's right like, yeah just, like i literally burned your entire cd collection i have an entire cd wallet full of shrapnel i probably listened to like maybe half of it you can only <laughs> exactly. like listen just like I don't know. I mean, I went through it. I went through my, my logic at the time was, well, if I want to learn how to play a guitar, why don't I listen to like a, a four minute song that is just all guitar <laughs> rather than like one song where you get like a sort of 10 second guitar solo. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a, it, it, when you're learning, I think it was this, there's some kind of uh method of the madness there, you know, but then after a while, you're just like, no, nah, I, I want to hear a singer, you know? So, so, and then that's, that thing, that's when I got into the, you know, the John Sykes, John Norum. Oh yeah. Blue so Murder. I, yeah. Blue, Blue Murder. Was through you. John Norum's um, phenomenal, and I feel like nobody in the states knows who that is. That guy is fucking awesome, man. Great oh, singer, yeah. Great player, great songs. I'm trying to think of what the album. There was a particular album that um, that I really liked. What are some of the album titles, if you recall? I think. Well, there was. Oh God, honestly, you're testing my memory here. I'm trying to think. Was one called another Another Destination or something? I that was that's... really, I th- really good one. I think, and, it, and then you had. Uh, Oh, honestly, I'm forgetting the names. Yeah, Face like the Truth. Movie. Face the Truth was a good album. That had like that Glenn Hughes on. That yeah, Glenn Hughes uh, on that one. But the, the, the thing is with Don Norm was like, everyone goes, what, the, the Europe guitar player, the final countdown, and just like immediately uh, dismiss it. But if you uh, listen to even the, the song, the final countdown's got like a tremendous guitar solo. That's yeah. absolutely amazing, He's you know. A great player, man. <laughs> yeah. a great, great player. Yeah, really good, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and, you know, Paul Gilbert was a massive influence, obviously. Uh, Racer X, Ingve. Uh, yeah. Well, and you've I mean, got the picking uh, technique to show it that you had those kind of influences. Yeah, uh, I, I have the Legato well, yeah. Satriani school, and that's it. But you, you've always just blown my mind, dude. You, do you remember when you were when you came down that first time, and we had my friend Rob Crosby? Remember he, like, you uh, ended up using his Les Paul. Like, I feel like just playing his Les Paul the whole time oh, you were here. Right, like, the nicest yeah. guy ever, man. And um, he had a I, iPad with a metronome app on it. And we were you had like a sweeping, some kind of lick. And we kept going up. I mean, it was just beyond ridiculous. Because remember, it was around the time those absurd videos started coming, like the fastest guitar player. And guys playing <laughs> Fly to the Bumblebee at like 900 beats per minute. Just absurdity. 
Yeah. And you did this lick, and we started at like 200 something, 16 notes, I guess. What? 250, 300. 300. We ran, we went all the way up to like four, 450. And then we had to like right. go to halftime because you were like going over 500 beats per minute with this fucking shit. It was like yeah. mind boggling. You can kind of cheat a little bit because. I'm fairly sure you know you 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 take you can take a like, take one note off and stuff like that when it gets that fast. You can't you can't tell. Yeah, it's just yeah. So just cram the just notes in, you know. And like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they always have that clock. I love the way they always have the clock in the background. Like I'm not cheating. There's a clock in the background. You can see it's in real time. <laughs> yeah. Like you put just Photoshop a fucking clock in somewhere. I don't know. I don't care. I mean, it's impressive, yeah. I guess. But I'm like, I, I've never yeah, been able to play fast a- anyway, so. It's just a daft laugh, isn't it, really? But uh, you, you, you'd have a play an arpeggio that fast of the song is like, Whoa. It, just, it just makes no musical sense, you know. What well, I mean? it, what you get out of that is freight train. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, best pre-chorus of all time. Just, I just wonder how you even write something like that. That pre-chorus to that song, just that. Uh, <laughs> and then, like the last pre-chorus is like twice as long. <laughs> freight train coming oh it's so good I, I, anyone who has not seen nitro freight train you have got to go watch that on youtube it's one of the greatest things uh, ever it is i mean uh oh i remember another song and i don't know when you were down but it was a band that was 2010 ish maybe in that realm or no they were way before that i think it was when i first moved to austin anyway this band called dream evil right oh that's and I right playing, yeah and I had the book of heavy metal, and I was like, dude, and you were like, that's it's good, and it is, it sounds good. Like, oh, and the guitar wise, solo's yeah. killer. I mean, fucking Gus G, you know? That's and, right, But yeah. that book of heavy metal, I pissed myself laughing the first time I saw that video. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's like it. Read and I saw all Gus, about it. <laughs> read all about it. That's all. Yeah, it's so good, man. It's, oh, God, so good. And then they have that breakdown where he's like, the book of heavy metal, or some shit, whatever he says. <laughs> To be, yeah. Oh no, he's like, to be or not to be. <laughs> it's like thunder and lightning. The drummer's in like some medieval attire. So good. <laughs> so good. Dude, I saw Gus G open for Vinnie Moore. Fucking awesome. And I went up to Gus G like, and I was like, oh man, I love Dream Evil. And he was like, you remember that? <laughs> I think he was exactly. like taken by it. Someone like brought up Dream Evil and he was just like, what? Oh, oh, speaking of that, you know, like, before this uh, COVID stuff happened, just before the lockdowns, like so about a year ago, went to see um, Queensryche in Newcastle, mm. right? Jesus. Without Jeff Tate, right? Like new singer. It's got Todd Latore, honestly. He was absolutely amazing, right? Absolutely incredible. Just nailing all that old stuff. Wow. But but Firewind, Gus J's band, were on before them. They were supporting. Mm-hmm. And gee, they were amazing as well. And he's obviously like amazing chops and everything. And then there was a band on before them. They were called Dark Sky Choir. It's um, what's he called again? This guy. He, he was in like Vicious Rumors at one point. Oh, this wow. Guitar player. And the singer, I think, was in Vicious Rumors as well. Oh, I forgot. I've, I've gone a blank of what they're called. Is that Soldiers of the Night? Or Vicious the, Rumors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Which was Vinnie uh, Moore originally, right? That's right. He was on the first album, yeah. And then, then they got like, uh, what was the name of the singer they got on after that? Uh, well, they got a guitar player called Mark McGee. who was like a pretty amazing shredder, and uh, and and they got a tremendous singer. I forget his name for for about four albums. This sounds um, like a made up name, Mark McGee. Mark McGee, yeah. I, he I was know, on. Mark uh, McGee on- the the second album I forget what's it called man the second album um, of vicious rumors or digital this? digital dictator was the second album mm-hmm. and then the, then they had a self titled album with the same lineup which I think they were signed to a big label by that point didn't they do something uh, recently fairly vicious rumors come back out and they, they still do stuff but I think that it, the lineup just seems to change I think it, the only original members the original guitar player Jeff someone or other Jeff Thorpe was that right. Um, so it's like a revolving lineup, but anyway, the the that gig with Queens, right? It was like the, all three bands were just absolutely amazing. Ira Black, that's the name of the guitar player who was in that first band, mm. um, and it's like he was like a brilliant player, you know. It was just what a gig, though that was. Uh, and, and Gus G, uh, just unbelievable guitarist. 
think he was on one Aussie album, or maybe two. I think he was on. Was it the Was it Scream? He was on. Yeah, but that wasn't but the name he, of the album. Uh, I don't think Black Rain was it. Black Rain was that I the album? It was, I think it was called Scream. I think oh, man, it must have been the album after that. Then okay. But he only did the lead guitar part. I think whoever did the production was oh really did all the and it's it it doesn't sound right. It, it, if they let him do all the rhythms, it would sound like mm. awesome, you know. But it, the last several Aussie albums, they've had like some producer guy record all the all the rhythm mm. tracks, and they just sound a bit bland, you know. Well, does Zach Wilde come in there and do solos and stuff still, though? I don't I, think so. Uh, no, I, he might. Long. He might have done some solos, but I don't think he's been doing the riffs, which is a shame because... I had that Black Rain album, and I've heard a single or two since. I just, I mean, I've kind of disconnected from buying, you know. You used to have all the, all the, you know, every Satriani, every this, every that, and I just haven't kept up with a lot of these bands that oh, same, consistently yeah, put out stuff every two years, you know. Um that being one of them, but um, I don't let's think anybody buys. It's, no, no one buys as many CDs. I mean, I used to buy CDs every single week. I don't think I bought one. Yeah, I think like in what one a year or something. Now you know, it's like it's not. Well, much. Let's talk about a CD you bought the first time I came over there. Um, called uh, I think it's called now. I want to say Prophet of Doom, but I think the album was actually called War to End All Wars or something. Ingve, right? Uh, well, I didn't actually buy that. If you remember, that was like that was a friend Graham? of mine. Yeah, man, a friend of mine bought it, and that was the album that I think, like, the engineer literally fucked it up. Like when they were recording, it just like didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. So it sound like sonically sounded like shit to start with. Uh-huh. But then, so it just sounded like sludge. Do you remember? It was just it wasn't a good. mess. Yeah. But then, yeah, that, that prophet of doom song. And then what was the other one? Black sheep of Black the family. Sheep. Oh Jesus! An Ingve re- regu- reggae tune. Yeah. And what, what was the words on that again? Um, if you, it was if like, you, uh, I have a, I have a Ferrari. It's shiny and black. If you fuck with it, I'll attack. That was it. That was yep. literally the words. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I remember putting that album on because we'd, we'd always go over to this dude's place who had like a billion DVDs and CDs and we'd always like um, end up, uh, you know, putting out, watching a movie or two. That's the first place I saw Spinal Tap, man. I think you too. We were just pissing ourselves laughing watching Spinal Tap for the first time. Yeah, and that's right. What was that pizza place? Best goddamn pizza ever, man. I, we oh, religiously right, ate yeah. that pizza every Friday. We get like a little mini keg and pizza or a bunch of beer and that place was so good, but yeah, I think it was at his place, right? Where we listened to that, and we were just like, "Good That's lord, that's right, this we is did. terrible." Yeah, we did, yeah. Because he, he sort of raced out to buy it, and then I thought, "No, I'm not going to bother buying this one." <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, but uh, but it, I mean, Ingve is like he he needs um, a better manager. Basically, he needs a good singer, better manager, and a good engineer that would sort. Of sort things out because he's his latest run of albums that sound dreadful well it's weird because the guy you know he, he kind of you know you can paint him as a one-trick pony in a lot of ways he, he really is i'm out seeing me playing jazz or anything but i've heard him on some of the live uh stuff where he really lays into some hendrix or something and, and has some great blues licks up his sleeve and, and yeah. you know, it's always kind of going you know blazing but there's a lot of stuff that he could do that would be musically interesting that I just don't think he ever does. He kind of just goes back to the same sort of bag of tricks, at least in the what I know from Ingwe. I mean, the, the stuff that he yeah. does, the stuff that he originally did is phenomenal, man. You know, and oh, it's, I mean, it's relevant and amazing. It doesn't matter if you like Ingwe or not. Like that stuff's incredible, far beyond the sun and all that. But like, um, yeah, some of the some of the some of the other stuff definitely can fall flat, and on a production on a production scale too. Oh, it, yeah. it, it's it, it's not good at the, like now. I think he's, but his ego is that big. I just don't think he would take so that advice. Can do everything. In, yeah, right. Exactly. Which is exactly what you need. Almost, you know, you need that when you're when you're young as a musician, and I only think you almost re need it later, right? Like, yeah, when you get to that place where you think you know everything, and you need someone else to come in and be like, nah. That's not. It's, advice. It's, that's, you see, that's, it that's terrible. You're not an engineer. Yeah, no. That, you that, see, that it happen a lot, don't you? Yeah. Like with, um, I mean, Metallica, they could well do with someone to go. No, you're not doing that. It's like you're not doing that Lulu album because it's shit. They, that, just I don't just, do it. I don't There's understand. No one that there. Album. I don't understand and it's like, it. 
it happened with Priest as well, Judas Priest, didn't it? When they were doing that, the comeback album, Angel of Retribution. Oh, I don't really and then know that. They did, they, they did a song called Loch Ness. And it's, it's already like, bad. Nobody said, that's not a good idea. You need not to do that. <laughs> they were just like, yeah, let's just do it. And no one's going to go, oh, Jesus, you know, don't do it. <laughs> There's a fine line, back to the, some of those bands I mentioned earlier, there's a fine line, I think, between going outside of your comfort zone, expanding, you know, cr- you know, testing your boundaries as an artist and all that, which is, you should do. But but then, but then you're right. Like, there are certain guys that you they really need someone to be like, no, that is, that is not a good idea. And your fans yeah. will definitely hate it and make fun of you. So if, if, you, if, you, if you can sort of swallow your pride, like, and then you get someone like Andy Snape. Mm-hmm. You know, when he when he started working with Accept, he uh he basically like locked them in a room with all the old all the old records and made them listen to everything. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're all cringing and all that. And he goes, no, no, no. He says, that's like a classic moment. That's what your fans want. And then mm-hmm. and they started honing songs and like sort of you know sculpting songs based on that. And then when they came out the album was absolutely awesome, you know? Which album? Uh, Blood of the Nations. Okay. It's 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 awesome. I mean, it's, it hasn't hasn't got Udo on it. It's got Mark Tornio, he's called, but I mean, he sounds pretty much like him. I didn't realize that Udo wasn't on. Oh, that, that's right. He split and he went and did his own. Yeah, he's thing. He, he's got his own band. Yeah. So they got Andy Sneap in, or I think he actually tracked them down. I think Andy Sneap, who was a big fan, he heard they were going to do another album. Mm. So he actually he actually volunteered. So oh, can I do it? Something like he basically like flew out there for free. I think to sort of persuade them that he could do it. Who are some of your other uh, favorite producer and, and engineers? Uh, I, th- I, mean, I mean, Snape's right up there. You know, I mean, definitely. I think I think he's kind of he's just got a sound, hasn't he? He just he just it's just amazing what he's doing. Jens Borgren, he's phenomenal as well. The Swedish um, guy, yeah, Swedish guy, yeah. Um, there's there's quite a few like really good uh, sort of Euro- like, European producers, you know. Uh, uh, it just seems like all the Swedish bands have these like tremendous productions, and it's like who's done that? Oh, he just did it in his spare bedroom on his computer. <laughs> it's just like so. There's there's loads of them, but I mean, I still massively admire you know like Mutt Lang and all those sort of. Uh, uh, people, but there's a couple of great like uh, I'm trying, is it called Jay Rustin who did he did the uh, one of the recent Anthrax albums. Hmm. Um, what was the album called? Um, it, it it just sounds. Ap- it, it, I think it's about two or three albums ago. Worship music. I think is it called Worship music. Or something oh like yeah, yeah. That, that, that was the that was the one where Joey came back. I think that's right. right. And yeah. it just sounds and like the production it sounds great. Is, yeah, really yeah. good. Yeah. And he does the Steel Panther stuff as well, I think. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of great people out there, uh, you know. Um, but I think, like, like I say, Sneep's up there at the top there. I, I just don't know how he does it because he, he just seems to, he doesn't, uh, if you ask him, he's like, oh, yeah, I, didn't, I don't really use any sort of reference tracks or anything. I just do this and do that. And don't put any EQ on stuff. And it's just like, it just gets everything right at the source. And it's like right there. Yeah. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> yeah. No, you, I, it's like, uh, well, it's like, I'm sure all that engineering in a sense is probably like learning to play an instrument like guitar, right? You learn all these patterns and scales and techniques and all this shit. But then it's like, you know, tastefully use it when, when it calls for it when you need to. But what I think can make someone like an exceptional, you know, player or writer is like really being you know knowing like the complete opposite of Ingve a lot of times right yeah it's <laughs> like knowing when to <laughs> hey, this feels like paradise you know just like <laughs> does that need a arpeggio run right there really but <laughs> you know like and i feel like I, that's where i am where i probably used to be as a guitar so i don't feel like nowadays with guitar stuff and solos i mean i've played over a you know jack johnson style tune and laid down a zach wilde solo back in the days where I was like, I, I can do this, so I have to do it. And it's like, that's terrible. That's horrible. That doesn't make sense at all for that song. Now I don't feel, I feel like, I, I, I think it's a tendency for anybody to want to 
cram more and overproduce, right? Well, I've got another this idea, and I'm doing it right now with stuff. But like, uh, but I think like my sensibilities are pretty reasonable there. Um, but I feel now I'm in that world with with audio with the plugins and stuff, right? Where I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, ooh, EQ. I, everything's got an EQ, and everything's got this, and everything's got that. And it's probably like, at some point, I'll probably be like, yep, that's crap. <laughs> 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 Yeah, it, it, there's a danger of like just having too much stuff. I think I've definitely got too much stuff, like fifteen thousand different compressors and all this. You know, it's just like <laughs> what? trying to write. What a are you song working as... on lately? Like, what? I mean, I would love to see, like we said earlier, you know, some of those old songs, whether it was old or new, like some instrumental stuff released. Um, I know you. It's been a while now. I mean, does the band Chaos Asylum is that still going? Or have you? Is there any? Well, what's going on with that? There's, there's like pretty much a whole album sort of hanging around, but they're having a bit of difficulty because I don't know if you know that Martin, the singer, moved to Spain, so he's uh, in a completely different country now, obviously. And it's just trying to figure out how how we're going to do it, you know. So I've sent them some stuff. Uh, it just, if we're just going to have to try to do it when we can and I mean there's just no deadline or anything for that but there's some good songs there I think you know I mean there's he's put some vocals down on a couple uh that just need a bit more a, a and that's things. all you tracking uh mix yeah, producing you're doing did, everything and yeah. the drummer like you try you track the drummer for that and then you guys do um like midi kit and then you got this you superior drummer and that's stuff right like that? yeah no. but uh, just a friend of mine had, had like electronic kit and we just recorded it there and then just uh, I just mixed it with Superior Drummer, yeah. So is that so, mainly uh, you and Martin, or are there other guys that are involved in that project as well? Or is it kind of a rotating? I think it's kind of gone back down to just me and him, really. Um, but we did have, uh, yeah, well, I mean, we had a, we had a, a, it was like a five-piece band at one point. Um, the yeah, thing is, were, that stuff. Sorry, go on. Yeah, you were playing some shows, and uh, didn't you have some... Uh, like opened up some stuff. Did you tour with Saxon again or something like that? Or no, that like went, no, that was the Blitzkrieg thing. We we uh, we got some shows in Europe. We went to Belgium a few times and stuff like that, and played uh, Bloodstock uh, in mm. the UK. Um, so yeah, we, we 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 got quite far in a relatively short space of time. But the problem is with that with that sort of music, it's 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 pretty hard to do. You've got to keep on top of it. So we're having to rehearse all the time, you know. And yeah, uh, yeah. And then and then we lost the bass player and we and it took us forever to try to find a replacement, and I think it just took the wind out of our sails a little bit at that point. Mm-hmm. So I think kind of just not, not sort of given it that much thought, but just sort of drifted back to the uh, the nucleus of it with this myself and Martin, you know. So I mean, we spoke about it recently, and uh, like I say, I've sent them some stuff, and it's just a case of like when we're going to be able to meet up and uh and get things sorted with it you know but i mean i don't know when we're gonna it could be like 2035 before we get that done you know <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh hey back to um back to blitzkrieg tell the wasp story about the, um you Old guys Jackie was, Lawless? uh yeah oh right he's got it and he was a total dildo right god I, when he said the wasp story i was like thinking was there like a wasp on the bus or something like that i go jesus <laughs> that's what i was thinking no, we uh, we got offered the, we got offered to uh, support Wasp on the UK tour, but like they sent through like his list of demands, and it was we, we couldn't do it. It was like we had to pay to do it to start. We could we couldn't use their PA. weren't allowed to um, socialize with the band in any capacity whatsoever. Wouldn't, wouldn't allow to approach. I, I think, I mean, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm sure it said something about under no circumstances must you look at Blackie Lawless in the eye. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it was something like that. And, uh, and wow. we just went. I mean, honestly, when when we got the initial thing coming through, do you want a tour with Wasp? I was like, oh, hell yeah, that'd be amazing. You know? And then when that came through, we got the, the details, we were like, oh, Jesus, I can't do that. <laughs> Yeah. They say we had to we had to pay to it was pay to play as well. We just couldn't afford it with yeah, anything nice. else, you know. So that that was a shame, but yeah, we weren't able to do that one. You know, I just love the uh, <laughs> <laughs> under no circumstances. 
Are you allowed yeah. to talk to the man or look at Blackley Lawless in the eyes? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was something like that. <laughs> no, no Crimson Idol references. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they had some I used great to love design. that album. Yeah, they they've got some great songs. Wasp. I mean, they're obviously known for all the kind of blood and gore and sexist sort of thing going on in the live show. But if you listen to the albums, there's some like crack and stuff. I mean, there's some really melodic, catchy songs, you know? Like Wild Child and all this sort of stuff. Just, yeah, really good songs. That's pretty old school. Was that late 80s? No, I think it might even be mid 80s, that. Wow. Like Wild yeah. Child would be about 80, 85 or something. That's when everyone looked for, at least when I, where I was growing up, everyone was looking, you know, Vic and I are, I guess, more me, loved it crucify tipper gore on this show who was cracking down on all the guys in the 80s. every time someone yeah. committed suicide in the fucking 80s it was metallica's fault or judas priest's fault and yeah and and then like ozzy's fault ozzy's fault all these fucking iron like, maiden's metal, fault iron maiden all they're all devil worshippers and i just yeah. all devil, all number devil of the beast and they, yeah, devil <laughs> well worship. that was funny wasn't and it because have you have you heard of that thing called the streisand effect no what is that Do you know what that is it was like apparently there was something happened like decades ago, and Barbara Streisand was like sick and tired of like the the media like trying to photograph her at a house and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So she like she like sort of went ahead and did some kind of like press charge or something like that, which obviously then got into the into the papers and ended up making things twice as bad. Like more and more people knew where she lived and went to photograph her at a house. Mm-hmm. So when Tipper Gore did that thing where she put like the little, you know, she insisted to put the little parental advisory sticker on the front. It actually helped advisory. the bands. It actually made them sell more records because all the kids yeah. were like, well, I want to buy that. So yeah, totally. it had the opposite effect. It's called the Streisand effect. Interesting. Ah, I never heard that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's totally what happened, right? And then, yeah. But I mean, I remember hearing all this crap like, oh, it Kiss. Knights in service of Satan. No, dude, those guys are goofballs. Like that, that's not running around worshiping the devil. They look like they belong in a clown car. You know, it's like yes. fucking wa- wasp. I heard all these ones with wasp, like whites against swarthy people or white. There was uh, there was a couple of different ones, but they were all so ridiculous. You know, like we are, AC, yeah, we all are the AC, sexual perverts, wasn't it? We are sexual. Well, I mean, that probably is accurate, but like. <laughs> 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 and then the ACDC was like the whole like, oh, they're bisexual. Oh, uh, ultra, uh, anti-Christ devil's children and like all this ridiculous shit. <laughs> oh, that's shit. right. It's like, if you, like, it's just party rock, man. It's just rock and roll. Yeah. I went to hell. They must be saying any band, any band in the 80s or not, you know, metal that said the word hell or Satan, they were automatically satanic, you know? I mean, look how bad it got with that, with the thing with Judas Priest as well, with the Apparent, like apparent backwards messages when they got they had to go to court, didn't they? It was it nineteen ninety or so? Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? Didn't, yeah, I mean, uh, they got all those bands back then. You know, yeah, all those yeah. Bands I mean, I think I pretty much board. ruined the band. You know, it's just it's really crazy. Yeah, I think I think like it was just a, a total mess for them. You know, like because hmm. yeah. it was supposed it wasn't a two kids like try to well uh, to, uh, try to commit suicide. One succeeded, the other one just. I think blasted the front of his face off, and and lived to tell the tale for a little while. But uh, but apparently they listened to the Stay in Class album over and over again, and the, and the, they were saying it said do oh, it. Oh yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. Well, I remember there was one about Metallica's fade to black was the blame for someone killing themselves and all that shit. Yeah, because like because well, I think one of the reasons why Priest eventually won that is because they t- they talked about you if you want to hear something if you look for it you'll find it so they were playing it backwards and it was like symbols going and I, I, it definitely says do it. so the, the, there's a song called exciter have you heard that song called exciter mm-hmm. by judas priest mm-hmm. so the band played it backwards right and it it sounds like it says i asked her for a peppermint <laughs> in the chorus and uh so they were in the court the way like, this this is going to say i asked her for a peppermint so they played it to the judge, and he was like, "Oh yeah, it definitely says that." <laughs> so it's like suggested, you know what I mean? And so yeah. I, I think the judge was like, "Oh, this is ridiculous," you know. <laughs> but, Good, <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, man. Yeah, yeah. And then like rap 
you know, 90s, early 90s rap came out. And I'm sure they were just like Two Live Crew was the first one there. But they won a huge lawsuit about, you know, for freedom of speech. Oh, when right. they got when they got sued and shit. And so I think once once Zappa and John Denver and everyone told Tipper Gore to go fuck himself and then Two Live Crew won, I think they were kind of like, well, all right. I guess we can't just blame <laughs> bands we don't like for yeah. everything that goes wrong in society. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, um, I don't know if we should get to the McDonald's story now. There was, I feel like there was another, <laughs> something else I was going to ask or bring This is up. the only reason you've got me on here, Ines. This only is reason. Story. Yeah, only reason. <laughs> Known each other for 20 years, guitar talk, all this. It's just all like, I just needed that to lure you in. To be like, so anyway, the McDonald's story. <laughs> right. Now, I'll, is, I'll, is this the reason why you don't eat McDonald's anymore? <laughs> oh no! This was this was po- me. Are you talking about me, right? Yeah, yeah. No, this is way post. I quit eating McDonald's in two thousand one. So, wow, wow. This, this, uh, yeah, I've not this. had it for quite a while either. I, I, Al, I have. I there's been two times I've eaten. I literally, I'm pretty sure there's been two times I've eaten McDonald's, maybe three, since two thousand one. I haven't paid for it any of those times. It still makes me feel gross and ashamed <laughs> because it's just like one of those things, right? If you've gone for twenty years without smoking a cigarette, and then you smoke a cigarette, you're like. Fuck, you know what I mean? So yeah. I look at McDonald's. It's just one of those quirky things that I haven't done in so long. Like one time was might have even been when you were in town. And it was I remember I think it was at Rudy's place. And then someone was like, hey, do you want a, you know, chicken sandwich? And I'm like, ah, fuck. All right. But I'm not paying for it. <laughs> and then another time we were like uh, we were like uh, on uh, played a show down uh, South Texas and and these guys like were super cool. It was like I think they were in another band or anyway, some someone knew him or whatever. And this guy was like, "Oh man, yeah, after the show, you guys come over. We got, we got burgers and we'll have a bunch of burgers and this and that." I'm like, "Oh sweet." And these dudes are like, "Gonna you know, got a bunch of shit on the grill or something." We show up and it's just a huge bag of McDonald's and I was like, "Oh god damn it!" But I was hungry <laughs> as fuck, so I just like ate a couple of McDonald's burgers. Uh, I remember being at uh, Rudy's and watching uh, Master of Disguise. Remember that film? We talked about that on Rudy's podcast. The more, oh, really? oh, well, you, and that's another thing with you, man. Like, I mean, with, with you, like I learned a lot about all these guitar players and these shrapnel dudes and all these guys, but you're also like this huge film buff and you know, like, you know, like everything about every fucking film, like every composer <laughs> of every goddamn film, like you're real <laughs> savvy much. on compo. But what was that? Is it called Empire? There's a magazine over in England that's that right, you yeah. used to subscribe to. So, you know, all these kept up with all these films and I'll never forget when you were like, when that movie came out. And we all watched it. I think knowing it was going to be bad, but yeah. it was so bad. It's like so. Master of Disguise kind of had the same effect on myself, Guy, and Rudy that me and Dave Tucker when we watched It's Pat, and we actually felt <laughs> ill when it ended. We were like, Ah, what did I just watch? It was just. It was like you knew it was going to be bad, but it was just so bad you could you could. And Master of Disguise was just a tr. But you, there was a there was. There was a write-up, I think, in that magazine. And I remember you telling me, it was like, this is beyond the shadow of a doubt, like the worst film of all time or something (laughs) along those lines. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly right, yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ, that movie was There's something to be said about bad movies, though. Like, sometimes you get movies that are so awfully bad that they end up being brilliant. Well, like a lot of Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, you know? Like all this classic Commando and all that stuff. But Master of Skies didn't work. Well, have, you seen, have, you, have you not seen? Have you not seen films like? The, have you seen The Room before? The Room? Have you not seen the film called The Room? I don't think so. Is that the one with Jennifer that? Lopez? No, it's got this. What's he called? This guy, and he's a strange guy. That they, 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 they made a movie about that movie with um, James Franco in it called Disaster Movie, I think, or something like that, <laughs> or something like that. Disaster Artist. That was it. It's That's so right. Okay. Unbelievably, it's so unbelievably bad. You have to see oh, it. Uh, I did not hit. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. It's just like the worst yeah. style of... <laughs> well, but, um, it's a Tommy... Uh, oh, what's that's that him. Name? Tommy yeah. was so awesome. Tommy was so... Yes, yes. That's it. Yeah. Oh, Disaster artist. That. It is so yeah. unbelievable. Well, and we want to just, talk about the worst movie ever, fucking Birdemic. Oh, yeah. That is just Which amazing. Is, dude, Birdemic is the most... Have, have you heard of this, Vic? Can yeah, I yeah. Show? I've heard of it. I haven't seen it, though. Uh, don't wait. I don't. You only have to watch. <laughs> I guess Is it we like were a just basket drinking. case. It's like one it, of the basket case series movies. No, it's it, it's, it's beyond so much it's, worse. It's so beyond much anything worse. you can imagine. 
beyond whatever, however bad you think it's going to be, it's a thousand times worse. Like every single frame, the acting, the special effects, if you could even call them that, like it, it there's no storyline. It, it's, it's, it's like upsetting <laughs> how bad it is, but for some fucking insane reason, Guy and I sit there and watch the whole fucking movie. <laughs> oh, it's like the new Star Trek series then, right? <laughs> Oh, I've heard that's supposed to be really bad, is it? Is it really bad? Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Uh, yes. I heard it's kind of gone off the rails a bit. Yeah. Is that like yeah. a, a TV series or what? Yeah, so is they came this? out with a new TV series, and it's unbelievably bad. Like, the they got soap opera writers or something. Uh. And the acting is atrocious, and it's just... it's it's. It, you could I I try to watch the first couple of episodes, and I was like, I'm done. I can't I can't do this anymore. Oh, oh that's a sh- real shame. Is that is that uh, Discovery? Is it called Star Trek? Yes. Discovery? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Was that uh, a hard bird, time? Bird is like uh, it's obviously about these killer birds, isn't it? But nothing happens like the, the, out of the, nowhere. The, yeah, there's like oh, there's yeah? like a like there's an, like a, an hour almost, goes by, nothing. All of a sudden, ha! <laughs> yeah, there's no lead up to it. There's yeah, no lead no up. No lead up. It's just, <laughs> and the opening, like what what I liked about that movie and. Granted, we were like drinking, and I'm I hope that had to have had some effect. Or sometimes you're just ready to laugh, right? But the opening sequence to that movie is literally just like a guy driving a car for like five minutes while the credit. <laughs> and it, there's nothing interesting. And he stops and gets gas, and he gets back yeah. in his car, and then he drives. And it's just like all pointless filler. Crap. Yeah, you, and then he's like walking when, down the street for like five minutes. I mean, I'm like five minutes of this go nowhere footage. And then, yeah, and then there's this whole pointless plot that develops, like, barely, but there's kind of something. And then out of nowhere, all of a sudden, birds are attacking. Like, none of it makes any sense. Oh, but no, what the best part was, but there was a political message at the end of the movie. That's what made it so great. At the end, they're like, well, with all the atmospheric fallout and the global warming, we've got to be more, because the birds are turning on people. And it it was just like... Jesus fucking yeah, Christ. When, when, he, yeah. when he's driving and he pulls pulls over to get some fuel, you, you actually see him get the entire fuel. Like he's filling it up. <laughs> yeah. It's like he's there for like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> here's another, here's then, another one you should see. Have you seen Samurai Cop? No. no. Oh, Jesus. That is just, that you've got to see that. It's that amazing. You have fucking... Jackie Chan movie or something. It's just, it's, it's almost, it's, it's like on the same level of Birdemic. It's just it's, brilliant. It's, it's a bold statement. I don't know, man. I, there was, uh, do you remember that movie Kung Pao, Enter the, Enter the Fist, I think it was called? We yeah, talked about that one with Rudy. It's a horrible movie. Yeah, we talked, yeah. but we laughed I our love asses it, though. off. It's we great. We laughed our asses off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's one of those where it's just, it doesn't take itself seriously. It's just so bad. Yeah, it's, it's, it's total, I don't even know if slapstick's the word. Just complete, goofy, ridiculous, over the top. <laughs> Once you see it about three or four times and you're like, oh, I love this movie. I'll have to, I'll have to tip that into account then and watch it. Yeah. <laughs> three or four times. <laughs> I've never seen, I've never seen it yet. <laughs> but, uh... So, Samurai, what was it called? Samurai <laughs> Samurai Cop. Samurai, Samurai Cop, Cop yeah. What happened was, it was like this, I think the, the, the main bloke in it was like Sylvester Stallone's bodyguard. So he was probably like, get ripped and he had get long hair, he could probably look the part, you know. But he had no martial arts training whatsoever, right? <laughs> and I think what happened was he just like, he just went, I think I'm going to try my hand at acting, right? So like, he literally just like spread a, like a resume around Hollywood and the following day it was like, oh, you, you've got this audition. So he'd gone to this be audition and the bloke was like oh perfect they got the part you know so he's like is that how easy it is that's great i mean he's like starring in a hollywood movie and it's just absolutely atrociously bad to the point where they were just filming like way over over time like i think it was supposed to shoot in like three weeks and like sort of six months later it's still going on and then finally like the the wrap the shoot so his um his manager whatever says look it you need to maybe just cut your hair off to you get more roads if you've got like short hair and stuff. So he cut all his hair off, and uh, and then like three months later, somebody gets a call like, oh, by the guy from Samurai Cop, oh, can you come back in? He said, oh, that you must have like a, a preview of the movie. So he, but he went back in and like 
the director like proper lost his shit. He's like, what are you doing? Cut your hair off. And he's like, what do you mean? He said, and they the had to do like all these pickup shots he didn't know about. Oh, so shit. they were like, quick, what we're going to do. So he just basically <laughs> went to the nearest store and got the worst wig ever. And he's just, so half the film he's run around this horrendous wig. Right? He's doing like, he's doing fight scenes, right? And the wig falls off. They don't even cut it out. It just comes off and he puts it back on and continues to fight. <laughs> All right, you piqued you piqued my interest. This is what this is what guy does. He he ropes you into just watching horrible crap. Oh man, dude. Uh, there's there's uh dude, I one I'll recommend that's just atrociously bad but also kind of great is this movie from the 80s called um Hands of Steel, I think. I don't know that one. It could be Fist of Steel, but I think it's Hands of Steel and it is bad. Horrible acting. It's like a guy as a cyborg and the government's trying to what that whole thing. Right. And then he goes and he's hiding out at a bar and somehow becomes part of a, <laughs> an arm wrestling ring. I mean, it's just, <laughs> Jesus. It's, it's, <laughs> but um, yeah, it sounds right up your alley, guy. Um, it's uh, I'll check it out. <laughs> you, you need you should definitely watch it. I do like a good, bad move. A good, bad movie. Well, as a movie fan, we always we've talked about a lot of John Carpenter movies on, oh, on yeah. this show. There's a lot of great John Carpenter movies. I don't know what he's done in recent years, if anything. Nothing. I think he packed in, didn't he? He got Dude, dis- he got really yeah. disillusioned. A lot of cool stuff. I mean, some were less successful than others. A lot of cool. I mean, obviously the, the most famous probably Halloween Escape from New York. The thing, uh, just an absolute masterpiece. Oh, Big produced. Trouble in Little China. Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, yeah. he, all these he did the music for that too, didn't he? Well, he did the movie for all uh, music for all of his movies. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah he didn't. He did he, uh, Ennio Morricone did the thing. He didn't do that one. Oh, really? But it does sound like his. It's his so main simple. Theme. It's, it's so got that simple. bum 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 bum. That's definitely John Carpenter. I think. I think he's come up with a few motifs. Yeah. And then, uh, but hmm. I think it's Ennio Morricone, or was it Elmer Bernstein? No, no I think it's, hmm. it's. Oh yeah, I think wow. it's Ennio Morricone. Man, yeah. I didn't even know. Like, um, and a lot of these composers, you know, you all we all hear these things, and we've heard all. Everybody knows John Williams. You know, I mean, um, Jerry Goldsmith and Howard. I mean, we name it. Who are those guys? On Zimmer, exactly. Right? John, who? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but uh, the guy I, for some there's just some names I don't. I can't say, and I don't know why. What's his name? The, you just said the Czars did a whole soundtrack that had something to do with that dude, or that was they were influenced by him. In what's his name? And he Marconi. just passed away. That- he passed away. Yeah, like that's last right. Year. Yeah, I think he just died and last year. Yeah, I didn't realize like all the cool stuff that dude is that. Um, and this movie I I think is kind of long and maybe a little boring, but the Hateful Eight that Quentin Tarantino he does the I think he won a uh. Some kind of award. I mean, I don't know. It was oh, an Academy right. Award or something for, but it's got a really cool opening theme. Right. And he right. did music for that. Yeah. Um, anyway, did all, he did all the uh, Clint Eastwood stuff too. That's like, right. Yeah, ugly, he did right? all that old school kind of western yeah. stuff. Spaghetti yeah. westerns. Spaghetti westerns. Because um, he, he was, was like in the same class at school as uh, what's the director called Sergio Leone? Is that right? Was he the director oh, of yeah. those films? And yeah. I, I oh. think. Ennio Morricone was like his classmate at school. He's like, oh, oh do you want to like, do you want to score my movie? He's like, yeah, all right then. It's funny <laughs> so how that happens with directors and um, you see that all the time, right? Like obviously Spielberg is going to go to Williams if he can, right? Yeah, yeah. You've always got Zemeckis going with Alan Silvestri, you know. Guy, was it you that told me the story about Al, um, Alan Silvestri where someone was like, uh, Spielberg maybe was was watching some some footage or something uh, what do you call it before it's out? Not outtake. I don't know. Dailies. Whatever. Dailies of a uh, Back to the Future or something, and they were talking about the music and and I guess Spielberg or whoever said to Zemeckis like, uh, "Who do you have doing the music?" And he was like, "Oh, Alan Silvestri," which had done "Romancing the Stone," right? And, yeah. And, and the other guy was just like, "Ah, oh, I don't know." And then he like they played the music, and he was like, "Yeah, it needs to be like that. That's perfect." And he was like, "No, that's him." You know what I mean? Yeah. Was it you that told me that story? <laughs> that's right, because. Um when Spielberg saw Romance in the Stone, he, he like he hated the score. He hated it. So when when he was when Silver, uh, uh, Zemeckis was doing Back to the Future, and he was like, "Oh, I'm, I'm getting Sylvester back," he was like, "He must have been going, oh Jesus." But then when he <laughs> when he yeah, it was right. And so obviously he, he saw some stuff and he thought it was like a temp soundtrack. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. He's like, yeah, you want to get some of that? And he goes, oh, that's actually it. That's the score, you know? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah big Lydian Wait, guy. Like, uh, go ahead, Vic. I was going to ask, Romancing the Stone, was that, who who directed that one? Was that Spielberg? That was Zemeckis. I want to say it was Zemeckis. Oh, okay. was yeah. Zemeckis. Wow. That was that's a great a movie. Great- Great yeah. fucking movie, man. Really and I like good. the soundtrack for that movie. It works. It actually works for the movie. Yeah. I forgot Danny um, DeVito was in that. They were showing that on TV a few months ago. So, so good. Yeah, it's that movie is so good. Um, well, the re- that was a massive Jane success Wendy? for Man in the Stone. That's how he was able to do Back to the Future. Because I think he had, I think he had Back to the Future from like the late 70s, early 80s, but couldn't, couldn't get the backing to do it. No one wanted to do it. And then once he'd had the success for Man to the Stone, people were like, well, you can do anything you want now. So he's like, well, I'll, I'll do the Back to the Future movie now, you know? Yeah. Actually, probably better that it waited, too. Yeah. When it, when it came yeah, out. Yeah, I think so. Um, Definitely. But Sylvester, uh, Sylvester also did, I think he did the score to The Predator, which is a great score. Oh, yeah. That's brilliant. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. It's kind of similar. There's, there's, there's certain and That's what things. I'm saying. It's got those Lydian kind of things in it. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he does some cool, like diminished. He he does a lot of cool little mod, modulations and diminished things. But there is definitely you can definitely hear that um, similarity. And then he got real kind of minimal on some scores, right? Like Forrest Gump and Castaway. They're pretty piano, real real minimal. Yeah, still very nice. I mean, I, I saw Forrest Gump not too long ago, and the the, the main theme of that's beautiful. Really, no, really he's, good. Yeah, I think he every movie he does, he's re- he's got a great sensibility about like fitting. Fitting the music with the movie, unlike yeah. say whoever wrote the soundtrack to Lady Hawk. Who, <laughs> who did who did the Lady Hawk sound? This has been a, a joke between us for like twenty years. Who did the Lady Hawk soundtrack? Well, it was Alan Parsons, wasn't it? Oh boy, oh boy. Do you know why it happened? Why he, it, it ended up happening that way is because mm-hmm. Richard Donner always edits movies to um, to music. Which I think is like an old school way of uh, of doing it, where like uh, mm. newer composers like Christopher Nolan doesn't do that. He like right. he edits it and then and then gets the the guy to write the music to that. But um, he, I think um, Richard Donner was like listening to the Alan Parsons project just all the time when he was shooting that movie as well, Lady Hawk. So when he was like driving to and from the set, he had that on in the in the car. And I think it just got the point where he just couldn't separate that sound from from what he was making. So he was so like, "It's more Richard Donner's fault on that one." Yeah, yeah. He just, I didn't even uh, know Richard Donner did that movie. That was probably right before Lethal Weapon, right? Yeah, but Lady Hawk was like eighty five. Lethal Weapon was like eighty seven, wasn't it? So, uh, well, Lady Weapon Hawk's a, a it's a good film. Lady Hawk, it's pretty good. I guess it's I've just, never been able to get past the music. <laughs> I've never given it a chance. Matthew I think Broderick? I was able to stay, accept yeah. it now. Yeah, Matthew Broderick, yeah. Michelle Pfeiffer. Who else is in that one? Michelle, oh, Michelle Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. The Rutger bad guy Hauer. from... Who? Rutger Hauer's in it as well. Is that the guy in Die Hard, the blonde uh, Carl? Right? No, he, he's he's out. Of, he's from Blade Runner. Oh, it's the dude from Blade... That's right. That's who it is. Yeah, that's who and is uh, right. The Hitcher. He's in The Hitcher as well, isn't he? In The Hitcher. That's right. Okay. That's right, yeah. Oh, I remember seeing that movie uh, maybe about 10 years ago for the first time. What, Blade yeah, Runner? I forgot about the guy. Or Hitcher. Huh? Mm-hmm. Which the one? Hitcher. Blade Runner. The Hitcher. It's good. Did you ever see the new Blade Runner or the new Total Recall? Have you seen any of these? Re- or the new RoboCop? There's all these fucking remakes now. Yeah, I've seen all of them. Um, I didn't. I didn't really. <laughs> I didn't really like the RoboCop one very much. I heard that's pretty pretty bad. I saw Total Recall. If the if the if they'd like call that something else and just change the story a tiny bit more, I probably would have enjoyed it more. But the fact that it was called Total Recall, I was go- they don't even go to Mars or anything in it. No, it's like really. But is that yeah. Colin Farrell? Isn't a yeah. in that one? Colin Farrell, it's, Kate Beckinsale. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and it's not, it's not it's not bad on its own terms, but you're constantly comparing it to the original. Yeah, and uh, but uh, Blade yeah. Runner twenty Blade Runner twenty forty nine is like excellent, really good. Ooh, that one's that um, Ryan Gosling, right? That's right. Yeah, I, re- I really like that one. That's excellent. I think I, I, I would actually say it's as good as the original. You know, yeah, the original is kind of an under the radar thing, I guess, because of all the other stuff that was happening in Harrison Ford had, being so huge in these other capacities. Right? It's just more this yeah. cool film. It is kind of weird. It's kind of dark and. 
slow, I guess. Right? It is, but it's a slow burner, yeah. I mean, visually, it's absolutely stunning, isn't it? I mean... And that was, what, 82, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it tanked at the box office, but I think every film that year did, apart from E.T. Oh, E.T. was the thing. That's right, yeah. There's loads of other stuff came out that just didn't do very well, like Tron, Bombed, like everything else in 82 I don't think did very well. Uh, The only thing people saw that year was E.T. Yeah. (laughs) Pretty much, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's weird, right? Well, oh, The Thing was 82, right? The thing, yeah. Oh, yeah. Again, I, I yeah. don't think that did very well either. No, I don't think yeah. So. And there was so many good. It's well, yeah. What a what a yeah. What a thing. Like because I feel like it doesn't it doesn't seem. I mean, it's such a different thing now with the music industry. But it seemed like in the early '90s when all these great albums came out the same year. Like you just had all these great albums, and I was loving them all equally, right? But movies seem a little different. It's like a couple movies have really become the big box office hits, and then some of the other ones don't really get. That's right. Yeah. Because everyone's kind of going and seeing the same things. Yeah. Anyway, we're talking about old school lifestyles. There's no such thing as that anymore. (laughs) Well, you 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 used to get. I remember it. it, Like you would you would only get like two big blockbuster movies typically. Remember, like I'm thinking of like you know, like say in 1993, you had Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park was the, the the main one, and then the last action hero was the other massive one. And then you had like some smaller movies, like I think Cliffhanger came out, but it was just basically <laughs> like it was just those two going head to head, and it was it yeah. seemed to be like that. now. Well, not 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 this year, obviously, or last year, but uh, you would you would get like dozens of the five hundred fucking movie. superhero yeah. movies, and Avengers this, and Avengers that. Of it. <laughs> and one hundred like, Star Wars movies, dude. You oh. know what? I looked up the other day because I ended up seeing this documentary about. Um, Mark McGuire and uh, Sammy Sosa and the, the 98 season when they broke the home run record and everything. And it was really interesting. It was really cool. And so it just got me thinking about way back then. I was like, God damn, I collected baseball cards like everyone in the late 80s, right? They're not worth shit. Like, no, this is worth <laughs> shit because they flooded the fucking market and there's no value to it. I remember seeing it happening. I was only a kid, but I remember getting into collecting baseball cards and there was tops and Donruss and there's, and then all of a sudden all these things came out and just flooded. And, Ever since, I don't feel like baseball cards has been a thing, right? And it seemed, but that's like, seems like that with every single aspect of life. Yeah. Whether it's movies, music, everything. It's just, there's a zillion of everything. And now, especially because everyone can be an independent filmmaker. Everyone's a rapper. Everyone's a this, everyone's a that. So it's just this endless assault of entertainment options. Yeah, it, it, it takes it's away. It's amazing how much is on Netflix and stuff. It's just mind boggling. Oh, it's- yeah. It's like I'd even complain that there's like too much stuff on there. Too much, yeah. So, yeah. so I've been on there sometimes, like spent like an hour trying to figure out what to watch. Dude, <laughs> I I really feel like that's what happens to me. I get on fucking Netflix and I just sit there and a guy and I and it's so overwhelming that I'm like, I guess I'll just watch Shit's Creek again. I think I did that with that. Uh, you know, I, I'll go to like I have a show and I'll just put on the same show for like months because yeah. I can't. I, it's just too much. And then and then I'll, in the office. Throw on the office, yeah. The, the yeah. go-to Seinfeld. I watched I'm watching a Seinfeld episode the, so the other night, and then once I, in a while, I crack and watch a serial killer documentary because they keep advertising <laughs> me. I hate myself for it, and it's just like, yeah. <laughs> well, fucking speaking thing on of Netflix, it, is a serial killer documentary. It, yeah, speaking of serial killers, I I hadn't watched anything on Netflix for months, and ser- the the new serial killer series for uh, the Night Stalker just came out like last I saw week. It. Fucked That's, up, man. It, it's great, but it's, yeah, it's Fucked messed up. up. And, yes. And the problem, I feel sorry for my my fiance and my friends and stuff whenever I watch something like that because then I had like a big phone conversation about how much a capital punishment and how I just want to kill all the serial killers and get elected <laughs> to office and fry everybody. I, it like really upsets me. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> wasn't it upsetting? Like this maniac runs around, rapes and murders, like all these people from children to old, I mean, it was insane. Oh, it was brutal. In it was brutal. brutal, horrible heart. And these all I, these I, I, I hadn't realized it was mid eighties either. I was thinking, I remember hearing the stories and 80. I was thinking, Oh, what, like seventies or something like that. But I'm like, Oh, well, that's Ted crap. Bundy, right? Yeah. It was the seventies into the early eighties, but they fried his fucking ass. At least he was on, he was on <laughs> death row for a while, but at least they killed that fucking piece of shit. Like, here I go. <laughs> I almost made it through a podcast without a rant. Serial killer rant. <laughs> this motherfucker, like for 20 years, he just sat in prison and died of cancer, which, you know, hopefully 
I would never wish that on a person, but when you're, I would, I would wish it on a monster, you know? So hopefully that person suffered endlessly and whatever, but like, that's the only reason I, ho I hope there's a hell for those kind of people to go there. You know, it's just like, it's just so upsetting to me. Like, yes, it's very entertaining. Right. And we're talking about it and it suckered us both in. I saw the, tra it actually scared me like the trailer. Did you see the trailer for it? The trailer is terrifying. Oh yeah. Like I was, I was watching something and the trailer came out. I was like, Jesus Christ. It's, made me it's got some great music it, though. It's got that eighties, like really, electronic music. Oh, it's really music. well done. It's yeah. done. It's done great. Like these are great directors. You know, the, the people that put these things together are fantastic. And it was interesting watching, you know, the people involved. I mean, it's 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 interesting. I, I couldn't know. stop watching it. I just I just went through the whole yeah. thing in one night. It's like yeah, exactly. next, next, exactly. next. Yeah, it's only like four four episodes it's or four, something. And I, I did that with the while last year or something with the, one of the Ted Bundy ones. And oh yeah, I haven't seen that one. I just don't understand. Like, it's so appealing though. Like, and, and there's a new unsolved mysteries. Like people, we just love. Oh yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. Oh, have they kept yeah. that same theme music or not? Yeah, they did. Kind of, sorta. It's pretty close. It's oh, there's no close. narration. That, there's no narration, which I love the fact that they didn't do that because you could never replace Robert Stack. Yeah, and so I like the way they just kind of made it a new thing. And but they, well, they had have the ma the theme similar. They had Dennis Farina there for a little bit, who was who was in Snatch, really? and I love that movie, the Guy Ritchie movie. Well, he's gonna you know, get shorty too. Oh, that's one yeah, of my favorite. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Too. Yeah. But I loved him in Snatch because he's the the American coming over to London, you know, and he goes through all that oh, shit yeah. and he gets back to New York and they're like, you have anything to declare? He's like, yeah, don't go to fucking London or something. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, he's great. Snatch and uh, uh, was it Guy, Guy Ritchie. Ritchie that did that, right? And Yeah. What did y'all think of the Sherlock Holmes movies that he did? I, I was pleasantly surprised, actually. I thought I kind of yeah, liked okay, it. Yeah. I liked them. He, he's got... He's got like a kind of strange style, though. I think his direct directing style and the way they look is a little bit mm -hmm. different. So you got to, yeah. you got to kind of get used to it. Have, but, uh, have you seen the? Good. Have you seen the new one, The Gentleman, with uh, what's the guy that he was in Sons of Anarchy, the main dude? But I didn't know he was. I didn't know he was from the UK. I guess he's from the uh, Newcastle. He's from that area. Oh, what's right. his name? Ch Charlie Hunnam or something. I think is his name. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. but he's um, yeah. Sons I, of Anarchy, a thing over there, guy. Yeah, I mean, I've heard about. I mean, the thing is, I, I tend not to watch an awful lot of TV shows, so I've I've heard people talk about it and things like that, but I, I just haven't seen it myself. But yeah, I'm, it's it's definitely a show that people have talked about over here. I've yeah. actually never seen that show. Still, I yeah. got sucked in. I mean. It. The, the, the amount of shows that people have recommended I watch on Dude. Netflix, and I was like, I can't even be bothered to start. It's like, exactly. you know, watch this, Especially and it's like, like eight seasons. I'm like, oh, I can't even be bothered. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. exactly. Well, that's why I like the ones where I, if I start early, and then you kind of go through it, you can you binge watch, but then it's like, okay, now I have to fuck off until the next season. I can't just like waste two weeks of my life watching nine seasons of some shit. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. So for me, right now, it's Ozark. <laughs> and there's this other one called The Sinner with Bill Pullman that's that's not bad. It's a, mm. little, it's a little weird, um, but they've done two seasons and the season three is coming out. And um, I'm good with those. Like people will be like, oh, you got to check this out. And like you said, though, it's like nine seasons. I don't even want to start, man. I don't yeah, wanna, I, don't I, wanna, I just haven't got time to do that. You know, yeah. it's, it's just it's like kind of intimidating somehow. But um, I'll tell you what I did watch. Uh, I don't know if it was if it was as popular over there, but the, have you seen The Queen's Gambit? Mm -mm. I've That's heard about on Netflix. It. It's yeah. about this. I mean, the thing is, it's one of those shows when you try to explain it to somebody. It's the chess girl. Is that the chess That's girl? right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you try to you try to win people all by going, oh, what's it about? Oh, it's about this girl who plays chess. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait to watch that. But it, but it's really, really good. Really good. I think it's only one season. I think there's only about eight episodes or something like that. Oh, see, that's but, manageable. Uh, I actually saw. Yeah, that it's really fun, good. Though. Really good. Yeah. That's worth watching. And obviously Cobra Kai. Have you seen Cobra Kai? No, and I keep hearing it's great, but I have not. It's really good. I'm really sure that'll good. be another one that you just start and then you're fucked. You know, you just. <laughs> it's only <laughs> it's only three seasons. That's, you, you can manage that. And the, the episodes are like 35 minutes each. So oh, that's, yeah, that's it's nice. pretty manageable, you know. Yeah. I, I've been watching uh, The Expanse, which is on Amazon. It's not on Netflix, but. Uh, I think it's it on Netflix over here, actually. 
Oh yeah, it may be. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's I a, think so. Yeah, it's a. Re- <laughs> it's probably one of the the best sci-fi series out there. So. Right. I'll have to, yeah. I'll have to go it's got um. Oh, the guy that came out as Punisher. What's his name? Thomas Jane, I think. Yeah, he's great in that one. He was in that yeah. film. Speaking of bad movies, he was in that uh, Deep Blue Sea, wasn't he? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Oh wait, I'm thinking of the wrong. Okay, there's a couple shark movies. Um, what was? The, I don't think Deep Blue Sea was the one. What was the one with Samuel L. Jackson? That That's was it. it. Yeah, really. I, uh, oh yeah, LL Cool J, right? LL Cool J. Yeah. And uh, Thomas Jane. I, I think it was like Thomas Jane. Thomas Jane's first Elizabeth role or something. Shue or some shit or no? What's that? Oh, no, she was she was in a movie called Piranha, Elizabeth Shue, which is horrible. It's no, her she, and that, the kid from uh, Stand by Me, Jerry. Jerry O'Connell or whatever. Right. And it's got Richard Dreyfus makes a cameo. It's so fucking terrible, dude. I, I <laughs> recommend watch. You should watch Piranha. It's unbelievably bad and, and also pretty great. There, There's the sequels. Uh, Piranha 3 Triple D where it's like summertime and it's like all the chicks with big tits, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, 3D, like like uh, Jaws 3D from the 80s with Dennis Quaid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man! Um, yeah. Oh no! Yeah, uh, Elizabeth Shue is in that first one, and it's got uh, Adam Scott from um, Parks and Rec. I think he's in that one. Maybe I don't know that. I don't know who that is. I'm not placing the face. Um, he's he's the brother on uh, Step Brothers. He's like the older brother that hasn't had a car oh, in yeah, like seven yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I I know another shark. Uh, there was a the, there was a movie that came out a couple of years ago called The Meg. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen that one. Oh, you Jason have Statham have it. in it. Jason yeah. Statham. That's right. That's what's funny about uh, Jason Statham. Always just plays the same part in every single movie. <laughs> yeah, and they're all. I would. I would. I, his best movies have got to be the Guy Ritchie ones, you know, Snatch and was he in Lockstock? Lockstock. Was, was he in that yeah, one too? Right. Possibly. He's yeah. in all those, yeah. I, I imagine, right? But yeah, most of the other ones are just. A, and he's been in a ton. And it's you're right. It's the exact. Oh man, speaking of like action heroes who always play the same role, right? Fucking uh, Ruby Steven Rose Seagal. Looking at <laughs> Steven Seagal nowadays oh, is so yeah. funny because Steven Seagal. The last movie I saw him, I was like, oh my god, he looks like Wilford Brimley, dude. Like it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and he's all trying to be all badass still, and you're like, it just doesn't work. Well, he, yeah, he did like uh, back in the day, like Nico it, and stuff was good. Wasn't that's it? right. That was yes, good. above the Nico. law. Oh yeah, because yeah, he, like, he was like, he was, he was a proper badass back then. But now he's like, what, four hundred stone or something, four hundred pounds <laughs> or something like that. He, he can't. Yeah. Even, he gets a stuntman to go up a curb. You know, it's like. <laughs> Vic, were we talking to somebody? Where? Why am I? Something is making me think. That we were talking to somebody about Steven Seagal, or maybe I heard this somewhere, and they were saying that like he's one of those guys that just knows everything about everything. Uh, it must have been, where I'm trying to think where I saw this, or maybe I saw someone doing a late night interview. I don't know where it was, but I, it that, might. He's one I, those, I think it was David Spade talking about that, like he maybe. was in a movie with him or something. But yeah, I guess it was an actor that had worked. Yeah, it was. It was an actor that had worked with him. And he was just saying like, he's the most, he's impossible to work with. He's one of those guys that just knows everything about everything. Nice. Uh, you know? I can imagine. I've heard stories about him. I think, oh, what's the name of that actor who plays, he was in executive decision with him. And then he, he oh, I forget his name. He's like a Mexican dude, I think. In oh, the, uh, uh, John Leguizamo. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it was John That's Leguizamo right. was in right. there. Yeah. He yes. said that like, uh, when they were rehearsing for that uh, movie executive decision that uh, like Seagal assaulted him because he wasn't getting his own way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, it was, I, yeah, maybe it was him. I, I definitely heard he, it's kind of got the Ingve rap, right? As an actor, like where there's just a lot of stories floating around about this guy's a douche. Yeah. yeah. He's but a he guitar player in, too, right? Yeah, he does play guitar. Yeah. He's, yeah. He, he was on two over here. I mean, it was probably 10 years ago, but he definitely played around somewhere around here. Mm-hmm. But it's like a kind of country band or something like that. Yeah, he's been playing forever. Um, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, uh, oh, hell, what the hell was I just saying? Um, knows everything about oh. everything. 
Ingve, uh, oh, Ingve. In, you because a lot of people are like, ah, oh, Ingve is such a prick and all this stuff, and he definitely comes off like an arrogant ass. But guy, didn't you meet him once and he was cool? Yeah, yeah. He he played in Newcastle. He did like it was like I think he was doing like a Fender demonstration or something like that, and it was at Newcastle Arts Centre, and it was only I wouldn't. Uh, there probably no more than a hundred people there or something like that, and the art centre is just. You know, it's, it's one room where you, you can perform, and then right next to it, there's like a bar. So as soon as he, as soon as he finished doing this show, he was like straight in the bar. So we stood having beers for like a couple, a couple of hours, I think. He signed, he signed like CDs and stuff, and had a good chat with them. He obviously just caught him in a good mood because obviously I'm well aware that it can be difficult, but on this particular night, he was absolutely spot on. You know, well. You did, you did make the mistake of trying to... Um, I guess he didn't have his Ferrari with him, so there was no danger of being attacked. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but uh, but he, he was he was on the back of that... You know, he did that classical album. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, 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 so he, he was performing some of that stuff. But I tell you okay. what, when um, he was sound checking and everyone just had to stand in the bar area, and he was... Uh, honestly, when he... The soundtrack, he just sounded phenomenal. He just play, he could just play like one note, and you're like, Jesus Christ! It was absolutely amazing. <laughs> and I was like sitting, uh, literally, sort of, I don't know, I'm trying to think, like two meters away when he was playing. I was like two meters away wow. from him, just loud as just, fuck. Was it super loud? I don't recall it being ridiculous because he was just using these like Fender amplifiers, and I think ah. it was like fa- fairly reasonable volume and he was like he had backing tracks of this orchestra stuff and things like that well you know because you got guys nowadays right and this has been a thing for a long time the guys that have the little you know killer little combo amp behind all the wall dummy you know cabs and this great sound is kind of coming through that's all just there for show but i feel like nowadays more and more with the kempers and all these kind of things but it see i feel like ingve would be one of those guys that would be like no it's got to be my scallop strat and my Marshall stack, whatever plexis yeah. or whatever, you know, like I feel like he's still like that old school, loud rock oh, and roll, definitely. whatever Hendrix did kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I, I can't imagine Ingve ever using a Kemper or something like that. Mm-hmm. Probably has some, some opinions on the matter. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he, he was, uh, he was cool. Like really cool. A uh, few beers and stuff like that. But I met him again and, he did a signing session in Newcastle a few years later, and he was, I think he was having a bit of a bad mood day that day, so he wasn't really very talkative. Oh, um, speaking of both Marshalls and, and people you've met, uh, didn't you have a, did you have a deal with Marshall for a while or something when you were playing with Blitzkrieg or something like that? Well, the the bass player in the band worked for Marshall. He was like a, oh. like a, a rep, like a regional rep for them. Because I so, want to say um, that you were telling me about uh, you you got you got to meet Kerry King at a dinner or something, right? And it was a bunch of Marshall people. That's right, Kerry King. Because I did the um, the hand fart thing. But I did uh, Rain and Blood. And he, oh, but Kerry, <laughs> I, he was like, he, he was, he was. I mean, he was joking. He was saying, "Oh, you should come on too with us and all that sort of stuff." <laughs> <laughs> so, man, I'm glad you brought that up, dude. Uh, hand farts. I mean, there's videos. We did those old videos, and I finally posted one like last year. I was like, "Well, it's 2020. Nothing's happening." I'm gonna post a video. Of, did you ever see that? I, I think I tagged you maybe, and it was like I don't we know. had a blast doing. We did about five of these videos because it's a, a weird talent the guy has. Like, dude, guy is like one of these like <laughs> it's crazy, dude. Like, you're such a renaissance uh, man. Like, I mean, it's just crazy because not only are you like this brilliant guitar player, you know, I think you've got you know fantastic ears and everything with the with the engineering and then but also when i first came over there like the guitar started for you as a hobby you were painting you were going to school for painting you've got all these paintings that you did i don't know if you when the last time you painted but when i first came over there that's what that's what you were doing during the day you were painting these and what was it acrylics that's, what kind of paints were you using yeah acrylics acrylics on the canvas because at the time i was that's what i thought i was going to be doing you know is there a place people can find that stuff online um there might be one or two on my Facebook page. I'll have to have a look, but hey, no, a lot of them. Uh, and I've never been so great at like blowing my own trumpet for that stuff. You know, it's like it's all sitting in the loft. I think. <laughs> but you were doing. I remember the one of one of the ones you did was the Atlant, the Lost City of Atlantis. 
And it was like That's a right. guy down there with a flashlight. And then you had several of sort of like spaceships and air battles. I don't know. But and then I remember like, but I remember being like in your living room at your parents' house. I'd be like, oh, who who did that? Oh, that guy when he was like twelve or some shit. And it's like this picture of like. <laughs> Yeah. Of, of of a of a river and a bridge and a dog and like all this kind of shit and you're just like jesus christ like it's crazy dude like <laughs> they're, st- they're still there i think <laughs> they're st- they're, i don't think they'll have changed the pic- picture since you were there yeah oh man i'd love to see them again dude i i, I so i've been saying this for a million years but to come back over there would be no you should crazy. yeah you should definitely come over sometime again well, um, we'll actually go places this time rather than just go to the pub and then go back. <laughs> that's the worst. I know. They were like, you should go do stuff. And we never did anything. Yeah, we, we literally went to the pubs and then hang, hung around. And yeah, did, did some music, went to the pub. That was uh, kind that of That was it. it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did you ever go to London? Places, go right? to, nope. Yeah, the pubs. <laughs> that was where we went. Oh, God. And back then, I was such an ass wipe. I, I would be like this long-haired, you know, dorky rocker dude. Oh, remember I had no love from the from the English women, man. They really they I I got I got rejected hard over there. Except for like one like at the time more of a I guess kind of cougar chick was like, "You're from Texas, <laughs> hi." And I was like, hmm, "Hello." But oh, well, I, dude, I went I there a couple, brutal, I went to London a couple of years ago. They, they probably thought I was Indian. Who knows? <laughs> That's right, because like lots of, I mean, lots of Indians there, lots of Indian food. We had a lot of Indian food there. Well, your dad is a fucking phenomenal cook too, so we always had like awesome meals. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. the hottest dude. I always talk about. There's a few things, a few things I always mention about my experiences over there. <laughs> that chili. That fucking chili. His dad made the hottest chili i've ever eaten in my life but it was so good we couldn't stop eating i think we had it like over rice or something we're just those carlings beers they used to we just ch- every after every bite we're like chugging half a beer profusely <laughs> sweating just covered in sweat but could not stop eating this chili because it was so damn good i remember it vividly i remember it <laughs> yeah. a couple of other uh a couple other uh oh man now i just got having all these memories of like um the time that uh well there was that and then your dad was like because i think he would try to get like recipes from my mom and stuff right like want to do some oh, texas right. food because that was where the chili came from and then fajitas and i was like thought it was really funny like so they were doing this big and his fajitas were fucking amazing but i went in the kitchen and your mom and and sister were there and they had like this huge ass bag of cheese and a big bag of chips i'm like right we want to make nachos what do we do and i'm just like oh and i'm like put a bunch of cheese on the chips and like brilliant <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's pretty much it. We just like put fucking cheese on shit and put it in the in the microwave, whatever. <laughs> I mean, Dang. such such great like yeah, the dogs back then, the golden retrievers, Zach and Jake. Jake, the dis antisocial grump who would just get up and drink the remnants of your beer, and then Zach, that's like right. the goofy bastard who wanted your attention twenty four seven with yeah. the worst dog farts of all time. Yeah, I remember that when he came he came in and sat next to you and all of a sudden you're like, Jesus <laughs> Oh man. And then which was the dog and then you guys got was it Jet was the one after them or uh Jasper. It was Jasper. Is Jasper still around or no? He he he, he died uh just over a year ago. Yeah, uh, okay. He was old, he was like six he was sixteen years old. Like, wow, he, uh, that's when he wow shit, away. man. Yeah, and then Jet was before them, and Jet was the dog that took a dump in your dad's coat pocket, right? That's right. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah, just to oh. clarify, he, he like left his he left his coat over the back of a chair, and then the, <laughs> gone gone to bed, and the next day come now, where is it? Where is it? I know you've shot. Where have you done it, you <laughs> bastard? <laughs> He's in the corner with his, his ears back. And, so, so like the, you... the, yeah, he'd like sat in the in the pocket of my dad's coat. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking brilliant, man. Uh... Yeah, when I first came, uh, well, you guys, I don't know how young he was. God damn, it's been that long. Yeah, it makes sense because it would have been about 2004 when I came down there the last time. And, and you guys had probably just gotten Jasper. And yeah, I, me- I remember he was a horny little bastard, right? Because wasn't like the neighbor and he- the neighbor's dog was in heat, and then Jasper's just losing his fucking mind. Oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> oh, I've forgotten about that, yeah. <laughs> and then the other, so the other story I tell, and I know I think I did this when you were here one time, and I know you didn't appreciate my horrific uh, 
in my head, it's flawless, but I, it's in reality, it's not a good representation of what your father sounds like at all. But dude, I remember the first, when I first got there, I never had any, you know, uh, issue understanding you, but your dad's got a pretty thick accent. Right. And, and do you remember like the first, so the first night uh, I stayed there and then like I woke up and I like went down, you know, stairs and ended up smoking a cigarette and I was like hanging out with the dogs. It's like, I don't even know where I am and how to get anywhere. So I was just like sitting there and your mom comes down and she's like, oh, hi, you know, and your dad comes <laughs> down and he's like, asked me, he was like, you feel too fry up. And I'm just like, what? And you're just like, <laughs> he's asking you if you want breakfast. <laughs> There was like, I swear, like the first few days I was there, I couldn't understand a word your dad was saying, man. That's interesting because I don't, I don't think his accent's that strong. I, just, I think, I, I think mine's, wasn't... mine's more broad. I think. Nah, but, your so. dad definitely had a draw. But you remember <laughs> the, uh, and and then the and then the lingo, man. I love the the lingo, and I brought this up because it's just hilarious. The whole, uh, your dad would get really upset about certain, like. When Robbie Williams was like a big thing, and he and someone with came on, and they were like, uh, "Oh, Robbie Williams, uh, oh, it's like the new John Lennon." Your dad about fell out of his fucking seat. He's like, "John Lennon has more talent than his big toe." <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one was um, when Elton John came on, right? And he was oh, asking me, he's like, oh, do you like Elton? He's like, you know where this is going. <laughs> he was like, oh, do you like Elton John? He's, uh, he's, cla- you know, he's class. I was like, oh, man, Elton John's class. Elton John's great. He goes, he's class, but he's a poof. <laughs> <laughs> now that I think about it, dude, that, I think that was one of the things, like, when you and I started hanging out, it was like the what we got along so well was obviously we both played guitar and had similar interests, but I think a lot of it was the similarities of our dads and we would just kind of, and then I went and met your dad and it was like, Oh man, our, our dads would get along great. You know? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But, um, and I think our moms would get on great as well. Cause I think they're very much alike. Especially after this whole pandemic, I just, it's one of those things. I just, I hope I want to just be like, go to fucking England, man. You know, like I know my mom would love it and I know my dad would too. It's just like hard to get, I'm, your dad's probably the same way, right? It's probably just hard to get him out of the house, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, just, I don't want to go anywhere and do anything. But, I mean, I know they'd have a blast. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that's some funny fucking... Sh- oh, God. And then... Um, <laughs> yeah, good times, man. Good so times. many stories. So many stories and just a ton of consumption of Carling's beer and Iron Brew. Ah, we went through. So- oh, Iron Brew. Yeah, you used to love that, didn't you? Love Iron Brew, man. Yeah. Can you can you get that over there? Mm-mm. I, I might, you know what? I might have seen it one time somewhere and I was shocked. But it, as a general rule, I don't think it's here anywhere. Yeah, because yeah. it's very unique. I, I can't quite explain how it tastes. Can you? It's like a like a mixed fruit thing but i can't really I became put my addicted finger to it yeah well you know i mean i was i had a i had a problem with it <laughs> i had a problem with a lot of i still have a lot of diet diet problems um that new music video to prove it <clears throat> oh right okay <laughs> shit man well i think um if you have anything so, I mean, you're on Facebook, you have the band Chaos Asylum that's kind of, uh, I guess, is that on? Because, I mean, that, that's what's weird, right? Like, things that were released even 10 to 15 years ago, a lot of those things aren't on the things that exist now, right? They're not on Spotify and stuff like that. So, I don't yeah, know where right. people go find that kind of music. Do you have uh, music No, I mean, on uh, those platforms? no, it's not, it's, not, it's not on, the Chaos Asylum stuff's not up there at the minute. Um, so... I'll have to basically re-upload it. I think essentially. Yeah, and then um, um, what do you what do you use? Uh, what are what are companies like distribution companies out there? Like here we have CD Baby, uh, um, DistroKid, TuneCore. Are what are the what are the big companies there? What for, for the same ones essentially? I think really uh, that yeah you can use. I, uh, I mean, I use like Spotify and stuff like that to get your music out there. But you just get a you get a pittance on that, don't you? Yeah, I I've kind of gotten to a point where I, I we're just we're fucked. It just is what it is, right? Yeah. And so it's, it's just I'm no kind of like, and a lot of people don't even fuck with it. And they just put it on SoundCloud. You're not gonna make any money either fucking way, right? Unless you get a zillion fucking plays. That's it. So 
I've kind of a lot of my stuff I don't even have out either way, and I'll just put it on Bandcamp. Man, Bandcamp's pretty cool, man. You know, because Bandcamp right. you can put it up there, set your price. People can go get it. I think Bandcamp's actually great. Um, mm-hmm. SoundCloud, but it's at least nice to have a few things floating around. Um, and I know you have such great stuff, but I just think about. When, it, when was that Chaos Asylum CD that I remember getting it from you on, you know, a CD? That was like, uh, what was it, 2012? And even then, like, CDs were sort of getting phased out. Right. We, we, because in Europe, people still uh, quite like getting CDs at gigs and stuff like that. So we, we figured that when, you know, we, we were playing in Europe and stuff. We I mean, we shifted quite a few CDs at, at some of those shows. It was really good. Well, you still can somewhat. I think it's getting less and less. But when you tour now, vinyls come back, right? A lot of people do vinyl yeah. now. And when they and when you play live shows and tour, having vinyl is a thing, right? And, and or having yeah. maybe a CD. And I've still got like all of us, right? We all have like boxes of fucking CDs that we've ordered. And then unless you're touring and playing consistently, because you'll sell them at shows, but you're not. No one's gonna. I've you know, no one's just gonna buy a CD. You know, no. they're going to just download your music or they're not. Nowadays, it's not even that right. Nowadays, you just go listen to it on Spotify yeah, or something. It's just so, for free. You, you make yeah, nothing, you know. It's, yeah, like, it's all stream. So I, unfortunately, I think like that's just kind of what what it is now, you know, and you just as a musician, you just have to make money in other ways. You're just never you're never going to make money on your music. Probably well, just, no, no, probably about it, you know, unless you're yeah. a pop star or a country act and you just have mega fans that go by those kind of people could still, but, but then you're at a level where you're dealing with like big record companies and stuff. And so who knows how that's divvied up, you know, I don't think yeah. most musicians have ever really made much music money on their music. I think you if know, it's it, always, yeah, it's, I mean, especially things. now with this, obviously this pandemic and everything, it's just, it's well, just you horrendous. Can't tour. Yeah. So you're fucked. Just the, the huge bands will, will survive, you know, Metallic Air, Maiden, the Rolling Stones, all these bands will be they'll be all right, but mm-hmm. some of these smaller bands, like they, 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 they are the, it's the the wrecked basically. The, what they're going to do? It's well, it was already like going down the tubes, right? It's already been a shit show, just on a decline for 20, 30 years, right? Since the nineties, yeah. and I think the mid nineties really changed everything. And and then like, or, or you know, right when you know Napster and all that happened, the internet started popping. So it's been a steady decline, but now. Now you've had all these bars that have been hit and destroyed. All these bars have closed. There's been yeah. no touring. There's been no, you can't go play. You can't sell merchandise. So it's just, yeah, it's, I, I feel like if rock and roll wasn't dead already, the pandemic killed it. Just put a nail in the coffin. The only the hope, the hope is that hopefully when all this is kind of over and there, there's that normality again, and people can go out as in crowds of bars that hopefully there'll be like a surge of want to go out and see live music and, and be at concerts and festivals. And maybe like, maybe like we'll get a, um, a second coming of, of, you know, of that, that sort of rock and roll concert, you know, concert used to be the thing. Yeah. Nowadays it's like, take it or leave it. Right. Yeah. Seems to be, I don't know whether it's going to be getting a bit older as well. So it's like, it's like being asked to do it. <laughs> yeah, there's for sure. For sure. And you have, and we have no, we're totally out of touch with whatever's, you know, cool with, the kids, you know, so yeah. there's always that, you know, you, you do have to consider that, but, but, oh, but, Jesus. but obviously the world is so different. Like the, it used to be like, that's what you did, right? That you either went out or you didn't and that was it. And nowadays it's like, you, well, you can go out or you can just watch whatever on YouTube and street, you know, <laughs> a zillion, it doesn't matter, right? You're not, you don't feel like you're ever super missing something, even though, but there are a lot of people, um, I think especially from our generation that are that that still like that and want to go out and see the concerts. And I think they probably are for a ton of younger people too. It's just different. It's just stuff that we look at and think it's just garbage probably that, yeah. you know, like they're, that's oh, they're just not they're, rock and roll to the younger generation is like Facebook, right? It's like, it's for old people. It's stupid. You know, <laughs> they, they want D, DJs and um, auto tune tick, tick tock, you know? Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. The, uh, I don't know, man. Or, Did or you tune. see that the? Uh, oh, go oh, for sorry. it. I was just going to say, um, auto tune does my head in. You know, you hear these pop artists, and the, the, you hear it all every the time. So, every song is like maximum four chords, never yeah. changes. Verses the same, chorus the same, and you can actually hear the auto tune. It sounds like a robot, and it mm-hmm. does my head in. I like it if it's used 
subtly or if you use it as a spe- specific effect for a song. Yeah. Like when Cher had that song, and it was like a big part. It was, it was cool. Worked. But like, yeah. But yeah, when you, what's weird to me is like, I'll be listening to like, if it's pop or pop country and it's not, you're not supposed to hear the auto tune, but you hear the, you hear it and you're like, this is fucking horrible. Like <laughs> it's, it's not, there's no, emo, it's void of emotion, you know? And it's just this part. I, uh, 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 it's just like it's it's fucking terrible, man. Yeah. You hear it on like, really ma- like Maroon 5 and these bands. Maroon 5. Uh, it's just Maroon ridiculous. 5 is like so boring to me. Like I just feel like they're the most. If there's a, 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 a if there was a Grammy for like most uh, bland, boring, predictable <laughs> songwriting, like Maroon 5 would take home that trophy. Like it's just. <laughs> and I know there's this huge fucking band. It's weird too. I've always found that band weird because Adam Levine is like covered in tats, but then he's like. I, I, he's like he's not it's his image is so different right like he, he looks like he'd be like a badass rocker but then but then maroon five is just like pay phone or whatever i don't know you know i don't <laughs> he's a he's a little poofy a little he's a poof yeah <laughs> i don't know not that there's anything wrong with it i just watched that's the seinfeld episode i just watched not that there's anything wrong with it Fucking it's like real. Back yeah, <laughs> So good. The shit they did it what, 30 fucking years ago is just so still so relevant and great. Like it's yeah. amazing. That's such a great show. Well, we we went to that place, didn't we? In in New York. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We yeah. Found that it, place yeah. Was, it was awesome, man. Yeah, yeah that's right. That dude, that whole, I was just thinking about that, that that trip we took to New York was killer, man. Oh, brilliant, yeah. Absolutely. Fucking, uh, I wish we had more time there, just sort of ran out of time, didn't we? So much Mem- we got do you remember, uh, as fuck at the Statue <laughs> do you of Liberty. Remember, do you remember Peter? The guy at the hotel. It's the same price. <laughs> oh, dude, tell that fucking story. I about lost my fucking mind. I was pissed. But remember, we got hooked up. We got free breakfast every day. Yeah. Uh, we ended up getting like free breakfast. And I think we got like a discount on the room. And we got the first night free because I went down there and like bitched and got the man. I was this motherfucker. <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 I saw- we, <laughs> when we, we got the, the hotel. And they're like oh, they're overbooked, so we didn't have a room. But we, we and I booked this shit like, like six months in advance, dude. Yeah. So like he, this guy called he was called Peter, wasn't he? <laughs> I don't remember his name. That's amazing. You remember? And uh, he, he sort of messed around. He said, oh, "I've got something sorted." And he basically like found essentially like a broom cupboard on the on the top floor with was one to- bed. Total trains, planes, and automobiles moment, right? Yeah. <laughs> we walk in this motherfucking room, and there's one bed in there, and we're just going like, what? <laughs> and he's like, oh, we'll, we'll get you a cot. <laughs> Remember, like, you had to sleep on that cot, and I couldn't even get by to go to the bathroom because it was such a small room, and there's, like, this <laughs> cot in front of the fucking bathroom right at the yeah. front door. And then It was, like, so- the tiniest room. And, like, so, like, he was setting this up. He said, well, I've got you another room. And then, and then Skunk said... So we're going to get a discounted rate. He's like, no, no, it's the same price. I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I was pissed because, okay, so we did that and we were, we had just gotten into town. It was kind of late. We we're like, all right, fuck it. We just went and threw our bags in the room and then we went to, the, went to a bar. Went to like, I think we were like pretty close to Times Square, right? So we just went to Times Square and the whole tourist. What about the Irish bar, didn't we? Yeah. And it was, we had a good time. Come back at like 4 a.m. because it's New York. And that guy, I think, was still there. And I, I, I can't remember if it went back down that night or in the morning, but we get there. And so they were like, oh, yeah, we'll bring you a little cot bed or whatever, right? And we walk in the room, and it looked like a, a fucking something they'd put, you know, Russell Crowe and a beautiful mind in. Like, they just had this, it's like stand up, and like strapped around. It looks like this goddamn, you know, mental patient bed. They didn't even lay it out or anything. And so we're in there, like, assembling this bed. Yeah, and then in the morning, the guy's just like, oh, dude, oh, my God. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I, I might have yeah, stayed we, at that hotel before. The, I, think <laughs> yeah, it was I, think, I think you did. Yeah, yeah. if you said yeah, it's around yeah. Times Square, they're all little bitty rooms. You can barely yeah. move around. Yeah. And they're oh, like, it's ridiculous. you know, they're like 500 bucks a night if, if you're lucky. Yeah, and, yeah. The, and I couldn't believe that guy was just like, uh, oh, no, it's the same price. I was just like. Dude, oh, it was absolutely ridiculous. Booked I mean, shit uh, six months ago, we showed up. There's one. We were bed. speaking about uh, we're speaking about all the bad things, but New York's amazing. Like, it's oh, no, it was... the best. But like, there was one other bad thing that happened when we went to that Irish bar. I got a I got a pint of Guinness, as you do, 
and uh, it was rotten. Like it was the worst <laughs> I think type I of that, Guinness yeah. I've ever had. It like tasted like someone had poured pickled onion juice in there or something. So I took it back of the, the the lass who was working there, and she came up with this bullshit excuse. And she was like, "Oh well, you, you've got to understand that like the further the further away you get from Ireland, the worse the Guinness gets." I'm like, "I'm pretty sure that's not right. I don't think that's the case." <laughs> so you said it's crossed the Atlantic, which means it's crap. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> I think, here, here's some <laughs> shit fucking Guinness. You're in the U.S. It's all shit now. It's all shit. <laughs> It's traveled too far. I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's because you're not cleaned the lines properly and you pulled. No, that was the thing because I, I think that that was the same bar that I think I, I had the same instance where we, oh, I'll try this, you know, Irish beer or something. And they were all like horrific. Yeah. Um, But that, let's see, that trip we did, uh, oh, man, we saw Fake No More. <clears throat> at, uh, oh, that was tremendous. Well, and that was right after you went to Austin. Vic, you were at that show. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I got I was so ask. fucking destroyed at that at that Faith No More show. Here that was in great because the, the played, awesome when show. we saw them in New York, they, they played a completely different set. Every set they played on that tour was different. It was amazing. It was like fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It was so fucking good. Yeah, I, I think you told me that they played... Uh, they opened either, with The Real Thing. Yeah, The Real Thing, which is one of my favorite songs on that album. And they... Their encore in New York was, I think the encore was Motherfucker, RV, and Just a Man. I about, I lost my shit, oh, man. man. I was like, holy yeah, shit. Because the one in Austin was it Be Aggressive, I think. For an was encore? It? Maybe I don't not. Remember, I don't remember what the set was. I remember they closed with From the Dead off the late, their Soul Invictus in LA. And I didn't even know the songs. The album hadn't even come out. Um, I thought it was like some random cover they, they'd chosen. And then what did they open with here? Motherfucker? Yes. Yeah. I don't know what they closed with here. I can't remember. I don't remember. I remember they played Everything Ru- Everything Was Ruined. I love mm-hmm. that song. But yeah, every set was 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 different. It was very, very I, cool. Um, I was really impressed with the sound at the music hall because it usually doesn't sound that good. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I know that... Um, was it maybe it was that clutch uh uh mass and mass there was a oh i saw black label there one time too and the sound was horrible zach wilde was really struggling because that you could tell there was some some real issues with sound seems like a kind of a hit or, hit or miss yeah audio slave played there it wasn't bad like the clutch oh, and mastodon show was okay i remember that i think it I was think the, the black label one i'm thinking of that was really, okay really bad I remember yeah. that place because it wasn't it was a sort of place where if you wanted to go for a beer, it took you like twenty five minutes to get to the bar. It was so <laughs> yeah. busy. Yeah. I've never <laughs> I've never seen it that packed. That that was super busy. Yeah, and, well, I mean, it was really busy. First time Faith No More tours and what how however many man they years. do it right. Patent. I mean, they they have these bands like Faith No More, Mister Bungle. They've done anything for 15, 20 years, and so when they fucking come out, it's like that shit sells out. You know. And it's still, it's like they're not playing these huge venues, but whatever they play, they're going to sell out. I'm yeah. sure they could have played it. They could have played a big, bigger venues too. I'm still waiting for Lovage. I brought that up the other day because I was like, I thought that we had talked about that, and there was another album that had been they, mentioned. It was in the works, and and but I, there's only I, still yeah, that one album. They they I think they were talking about making another one, but then it was uh, they came out with a song with just. Jennifer Charles. Jennifer Charles and uh, Dan the Automator. Dan the Automator, yeah. And that and it's maybe been like five years since that song came out. But yeah, I'm waiting for that one. Yeah, no, that's true. I don't know. I don't know if there's ever going to be another Lovage or Peeping Tom. He's kind of got his projects that, but then again, no one ever thought there'd be another Bungle, so. That's right, Peeping Tom. Oh, yeah. I forgot has about got, that has one. Has he got Dave Lombardo now? And Scott yeah. Ian from Anthrax. Wow, yeah. that's that's tremendous. Have, have you, what's the stuff like? Is it good? It's just total thrash. So what they did is they they went back to and and that was the thing. Scott Ian told the story about Mike Patton or whoever talked to him, and he has always been a big Mike Patton, Faith No More, Bungle fan, and all that stuff. But so Mr. Bungle, way back when they started, I guess in the kind of early '80s as high school kids, like they were super into like Anthrax and Slayer and these old thrash bands. And so, and then Dave Lombardo has played with Mike Patton in a few different projects in, you know, the last, over the last couple 20 years or whatever. So they were like, 
they got this idea to come back and do another bungle, but they went back and did their 1986 or whatever demo called the Raging oh, Rascals. Right. And it was all these old, super fucking thrashy songs. And like, the only way we want to do this is that we can have our idols that influenced us in the first place to play with us. And so they got Dave Lombardo and uh, Scott Ian on board. And man, I got to say, That's like, awesome. it was, I was like, Fuck, it was, I mean, these dudes are like 50, right? They're all in their 50s. And it was brutal. Like, yeah. a, like an hour and a half of just, I, like, these guys are all so eclectic and all the things they've done, right? But And we all think of Dave Lombardo, maybe Scott. But even Scott, you know, I was just like watching these guys play that shit. I was like, dude, like just every song was like, ah, well, you know, just <laughs> like fucking solos. Nonsense Slayer solos almost, but it fits, you know? It was <laughs> like. Every fucking song was on. They opened up with the Mr. Rogers theme and then <laughs> and then did an entire set of just absolute brutal thrash that no one's ever fucking heard. And then and then they did a and then they did that song Summer Breeze in the middle of the set like randomly, right? <laughs> but uh yeah, I was like if it was such a uh you know, just being in the moment of it was cool, but in terms of like the actual music like there was like you know, you're not going there to watch anything melodic whatsoever. <laughs> but what's cool about that album is that album actually had like a lot of charting success because, you know, which I love in this pop world, right? Where it's so hard for, I think, anything rock based and metal based, unless you're Metallica or something these days to get here. This band comes out that hasn't put an album out for 20 fucking years and puts out this a ridiculous fucking thrash album and it fucking charts. So it was pretty <laughs> awesome. That is pretty cool. That's yeah. awesome, yeah. I'll have to check it out. I've, I've seen pictures and I saw the news about it and stuff. And I was like, oh, wow, that's absolutely tremendous. Yeah, but I didn't, know, it, I didn't know the story behind it. Yeah, it's so, and it's so different than anything they left off with because they had, you know, their old music was very all over the place genres. Yeah. Right? Just crazy stuff. And this was just, nope, thrash, boom. And Mike Patton's just like, yeah, you're, you're not going to know any of this. <laughs> we're going to play a whole <laughs> we're gonna play a whole bunch of shit you've never heard before. And that's what, exactly what they did. Uh, but and they did a um, we were talking to Eric Livingston Vic about that. Remember, I was like, oh, yeah, about the flyer he did for Halloween. They did a mimic of a John Carpenter Halloween flyer. Yeah. And yeah. It was like the night they came home and they did a live stream on Halloween last year. It was fucking really cool, man. Like a full on concert because they only played like we saw them right before the pandemic. Everything went to shit. They played mm. um, L.A., San Francisco and New York in February. And that was it, you know. I'm trying when to think, uh, the world was still okay. Uh, yeah, back then it was kind of like, oh no, another another thing happening in China, and then remember yeah. there was the there was like a cruise ship that was like, oh, uh, you know, and all of a sudden all and we we're oh, it's so weird, right? Because then you're watching Italy and you're like, oh my god, ten thousand deaths, and here we are now with like nearly half a million. It's just really? life now. Is that it's what like, it's up to? Oh, the U.S. is a catastrophe beyond. It's just a fucking shit show. I know England's. Well, yeah fucking mess too oh yeah we i think we've gone past a hundred thousand oh which uh it's like i mean yeah it's, it's horrendous really it's horrendous you know hey man before we close uh with your uh classic mcdonald's story i'm curious about uh <laughs> uh <clears throat> let's talk quick guitars and gear and stuff so is that your white ibanez behind you the classic white ibanez with the dragon or no that was the jackson which one had the dragon that's the Jackson. That's over there. I can get it if you want. Hang on. I'll have to take the headphones off a second. I remember a guy when, when I went over there was like played, had played his original Jackson guitar, which I don't think it's this one. Yeah. Oh, wow. Nice. I remember that guitar. Yeah. Dang. And then you have a blue jet. He has a blue Jackson too, that I think he took to MI. And he had, maybe it was that one of the two. And then when I was over here, he had played it so much. He was like, I really needs another fret job, but I just can't be bothered with it. And he was like, check it out in the, in, in the intonation <clears throat> guy. Hello. I'm just talking about how that time, I think, I don't know if it was your Blue Jackson, because your Blue Jackson your, was your original guitar, right? And then you got that one that you just showed us. The blue one was the one I took the MI and stuff. I've right. since sold that one. That's, that's uh, gone now. When, when, I, when you first came over, I've just got this one. Okay. Okay. That Ibanez, okay. remember that one? Yeah, that's, that's the Ibanez. That, that's that still plays great. That it's that's like probably my favorite what's, guitar. That one. What's behind you then? Are those both? Um, this one. 
this is the Dean guitar that I that I was playing when I was in Blitzkrieg because I had a, had a Dean uh, endorsement in that ah, band. That's right. Right. Okay. That's another Ibanez. That one. That's the that's okay. the most recent purchase. It's uh, it's called I. I think it's called Iron Label. I think that was the series. Hmm. So it's got like EMGs as standard in it, and you know, thin neck, all that sort of stuff. Actually, it, it's thin neck, but it's slightly thicker than the than this one. So it's, I liked uh, those Ibanez, like the Satriani models. I think they had a pretty thin neck, but they felt really good. Yeah, I like those. Uh, uh, I Ibanez telling, is my favorites, definitely. The, the Dean's was, not really my favorite. Like it's it, it's it's not really. What not, is I'm it? Not what's, a big fan what of is it. it? Just the feel of it, or what's the? What's yeah, the just the, the feel. But I mean, also, I tell you what bothers us about this is when you're playing the guitar and you've got the whammy bar there. Look, I don't know if you can see this. Mm-hmm. Where the, the the toggle sw- switch is like right underneath where that would be hanging, so uh, all, all okay. this is in the wrong place. Like even that's in the wrong place. Oh. Uh, the volume pot, so that kind of really bothered us. I like to be able to just quickly. Dude, I've had that. That can be a problem with your with your whammy bar getting down there and hitting your volumes. I think I feel like I've had that on, yeah, on a guitar so. before, but I don't tend to play tremolo guitars too often. It's got quite, I and mean, it's a very strat sort of style neck on this as well, which I don't yeah. mind. But uh, that sounds pretty good, though. It's got some, the pickups are decent on that one. I was telling Vic when you were going over to grab that uh, Jackson, the Dragon was, uh, I, there was one time, and I can't remember if it was that guitar or the blue, uh, the blue Jackson when you were like, you're like, yeah, it really needs a new fret job or whatever, but I just can't be bothered with it. And you're like, check, and you play the intonation. And it was like the intonation on the high E, like 12th fret was like almost an entire half step out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, that. The, it probably was the that, that uh, Jackson. I think I've just essentially played that one out. I did get it refretted, uh, but it's just never felt the same. The Jackson one or, or the white? Yeah, one? Yeah, the white one. Dude, yeah. I had a I had a Takamidi got, got ruined from a bad fret job. Yeah, gave it to a luthier and they just just destroyed it. So I'm really um i've only i think i had my washburn refretted years back and maybe my strat once i know a couple of my guitars could really go for that at this point but yeah. i'm almost hesitant man i, 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 I think don't know what happened same. dude and it just got fucking trashed i think it would, take some, it would take something now for me to consider getting the guitar refretted i mean I just, you can just get them leveled off can't you mm-hmm. i think i'd rather just get that done if i had to but um I don't think I go st- down that route. I just don't think I use the guitar as much. <clears throat> what do you use it. amp? What do you use amp wise these days? I mean, are you doing stuff in Logic? Do you have a Kemper or something like that? Or I mean, you played Ingles live. I, I guess you. I've still Ingles. got. I've still got that Engel, um, which is it sounds amazing, but the cab's so damn heavy. Mm. Um, you got a bad back like I've got. It's just a bit of a bit of a, a chew on for gigs, but I still use it because it sounds great. I've got a Kemper as well. Which I, I kind of just use for rehearsals and stuff like that. Um, it's 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 okay. I, I think when you when you really get the volume up, it doesn't it's it hasn't got the same right. balls yeah. as using a, a proper amplifier. But in the when I'm just using uh, Logic, I'm using the uh, Neural DSP stuff. You know that company, Neural DSP. Hmm. And the the oh the fantastic. The, I think the first thing they released was called the the Fort and Nameless. What's it called? The Fortin Nameless. That no, was the, the first one. The, com- the, the company. The company's yeah. called ne- Neural DSP. How do you spell that? Uh, Jesus, Neural. I don't know, man. N. 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 E. Okay, I see it. Yeah, I see it. It's three o'clock in the morning and I can't spell it. That's right. Yeah, I forget. But they they do like amp sims, so I've just got them on the computer. They sound great, you know. Right. Uh, so for practicing and recording, I'm just using those basically. Um, like I don't I don't really use the Kemper as that was what I originally intended the Kemper for, but then mm. happened to get a demo of this uh, neural DSP stuff and go oh, bloody hell, that's uh, wow, absolutely spot on. That I'm just going to go with that, you know. So they 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 sound fantastic. I think they're like right sort of at the at the head of the game at the minutes with uh I'm gonna, I'm gonna a b how do you spell kemper i'm gonna a b these <laughs> kemper uh, k-e-m-p-r i think i just about to do that yeah now i've used a kemper um 
And I've seen more and more of those. And I think definitely it's nice if you're going to play like a really big show, right? And you've got like the facility and the big stage and the whole nine, like take your your kick ass gear, right? But yeah. I feel like, you know, if you're just going to go show up and play a little bar and just kind of a small stage, kind of pick, fuck it, right? Like easy. You don't have to haul around yeah. a big amp and all that heavy shit. I think I do, so, a lot of guys doing that. Some of the bar, I mean, I went to see uh, Devon Townsend about five years ago. Uh, Nottingham Rock City, which is a big venue, uh, and the whole band, there, were, there was no backline whatsoever. It was just Kempers. They would all had in ear stuff. Yeah, so, that sounds right for Devin Townsend. I, I can yeah. see that with him, you know? The only thing is, I mean, I think that, so you, you run the whole show off a laptop, basically, so if the, if the laptop fucks up, yeah. then you, you're screwed, like... I think like it when I saw happened. one of the most boring <laughs> concerts in my, in my life. I don't know, it's like a tie between... These guys and Neil Young, but uh, uh, Crystal Method, right? And it wasn't my idea to go. And the motherfuckers are just up there taking turns. One guy's farting around doing whatever the hell they're doing. And the other guy's drinking beers upstairs. And then I shit you not. One of the guys tripped over the fucking main cable and unplugged the laptop and their DJ gear. And then they're like, whoops, sorry. Like that happened. <laughs> that Everyone was getting all like very pro. I was like, oh, is this supposed to be a really long break in the song? And everyone's like, my ex is wearing off. And then they were like, oh, sorry, I tripped over the cable. It's like, wow, that's embarrassing. I, I don't know. Like, they might probably have some cool stuff. But I just, after seeing that, I, I, it's a different culture, the whole DJ thing. I've actually seen some really cool, great DJs, you know, um, and I like them a lot of times mixed in with bands. I think it's really cool, like Peeping Tom. I think Dan the Automator toured with them. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird to me when you just see like a guy with a fucking laptop, you know, and yeah. like dancing it's, around. I mean, it's, it's if when it's working, I mean, it sounds like a fantastic idea if you, if you like set up a logic project or something. And you can, well, so you many can, guys like, do that now. You're right, but if it fucks up yeah. your whole program, I know bands that everything, all the clicks, the lights, everything, everything. Is yeah, but I mean, you, you oh. can you can trigger like your amp changing sounds you like your lead boost coming on you never even have to have any floor pedals or anything yeah i was so born at the wrong time like i I was meant to play music in like the 70s when you didn't have to do anything except for just (laughs) plug in and and rock out and yeah you know like that's that's what i do like i I, when it gets to all the technical stuff i just i'm really not good at it that's that's one of the reasons why i I don't really like the kemper like the kemper is literally like this right like the manual is like manual is like this thick, right? There's and it's so like many, literally yeah. like it's like I need to, I need to change the volume. It's like oh, if you need to change the volume, please consult chapter eighty two. <laughs> you know, it's like what well, can I just turn it down? No, because there's so many different volumes on it. You've got to read yeah. the manual. I'm like, for God's sake, man, I just want to play the sudden guitar. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. It's uh, simple is good. Simple oh, as always good. Definitely. Okay, man. Let's do it. Let's get this McDonald's story in. We, I keep thinking like we, we go to do these podcasts. Hopefully it won't be as bad with remote, you know, our separate audios. But I'm like, okay, we should really start getting these things down to an hour and a half. Three yeah, hours. How long has this been going? Like three hours. Jesus. Yeah, the sun's coming up in England. This is what we do to our overseas <laughs> guests. We like you can see by my summer. eyes now. <laughs> <laughs> McDonald's yeah. story and then you're free to go. Cool. Yeah, I think we, we did talk some music, and it was you know it was about a sixty forty split between music and farts and shit and things. No, we didn't got... really talk about farts and shits too much, honestly. Started off that way, so I think it got off to a bad start because I think most people are going to start watching and going, "Oh Jesus!" And yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I should probably just be censored. We're like we only Vic can talk for the first thirty minutes of the podcast, and that way yeah. we can get, get our substance and content in before I ruin it with. Hey, you know what? We made it through a whole episode. I only did a small serial killer rant, and we didn't talk about porn at all. So that's pretty all good. Right. That is pretty good. Yeah. So McDonald's. What? All right. Yeah, we'll have to get, have you back on the podcast so we can make sure we cover those topics: porn and farts. <laughs> oh yeah, well I'll be back in a couple of weeks for that definitely. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'll tell you the story. I'm not going to uh, name anybody, obviously, because uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's a friend of mine, and you know I want to spare his embarrassment. Um, but someone I know uh, 
was was start he was dating this girl he'd been on a i think they were on the second date right and uh they'd gone to the they'd gone to the cinema it was a i don't know if you remember skunk but the the metro center we went a couple of times yeah it's like a giant out out of town uh shopping center a big cinema there you know so like she'd she'd like picked him up and, and the driven there you know and uh when he went in, he he'd got this like massive thing of uh, nachos with like shitload of chilies on the top, you know the whole works like that. He's sitting there, and I went to see one of the mo- you're laughing already. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, they went to see one of those Marvel films, you know. He's sitting there munching away. I think it's like sort of three quarters of the way through. He's like, "What, oh, Jesus Christ!" His stomach's playing hell, you know. And like she notices in some kind of discomfort. She's like, Yeah, all right. He's like, Yeah, 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 I'm fine, yeah. But he's like sitting there, go, Jesus. Anyway, I guess to the end of the film, and she's like, the credits come up and she's like, get yourself to the toilet. And he's like, No, no, because you remember how the, the Marvel films all had that always had that one bit right at the end of the credits. Oh, yeah. So he, yeah. he's sitting there going, Oh, Jesus, just so we can see this like 30 second thing at the end. And she's like, I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you what it is. <laughs> he's like, No, no, I'm, I'm a big Marvel fan, you know. So it gets it, he watches it and, it, and then he fucking darts out to the toilet. He gets into the toilet in the cinema and he's like, oh, I think I'm all right. I'm all right, I think. So he tries to go, nothing. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. So he comes out and uh, the lassie he's dating says, have you managed to go? He says, no, I'm all right. She's like, are you sure? Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. So uh, anyway, they get in the car there and the drive, and like it's a, it's, a, it's a good drive back to where they're going. So they're, they're going down the motorway, you know, 10 minutes, and he just suddenly turns and he goes, you're going to have to pull over here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, where? Where can I pull over? He said, we've got to pull over. So I'm on the fucking motorway. Where am I going to pull over? And he's like, quick, just pull. So she basically just takes this first junction off the motorway down, and then she sweeps around. And then they're driving around. He's like, you're going to have to stop somewhere. And she's like, I don't know what I'm doing. He goes, look, there's a McDonald's up here. <laughs> so she, she pulls at the McDonald's. And by this point, I should clarify, it's like, it's really late. You know, it's like 11.30, 11.45 at night. I should, have, I should have said that. So there's just nobody about. Anyway, so he gets out and he goes like barging into this McDonald's. And there's just no one in there. There's no, there's no staff or anything. <laughs> so he, but he, he just doesn't give a shit. So he um, races into the toilet, into this cubicle, and uh, anyway, so he's in there, and you know, you know what it's like when, when you, you're almost there, your your body just starts to go all right. Well, we've made it, and he's like, he's trying to, <laughs> he's trying to get his jeans off. And he just can't get his he can't get his belt undone, so he shits himself, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he pulls he pulls his jeans and his pant like his boxer shorts like down to his knees, and like there's just this giant like valley of shit. But it's just all it's just all caught in his boxer shorts. So he's going, if I can just. If I can just get out with these, I'll just like ditch me boxer shorts, put me jeans back on, I'll be all right. So he's like, he's basically, so he's trying to do that, but obviously he's in this tiny cubicle in this McDonald's. He's trying to get, uh, trying to get his jeans off where he, he, he slips, doesn't he? And he falls over <laughs> and shit everywhere. It's just fucking shit. It's like, all over the walls, over the floor, on his jeans. It's on his T-shirt, oh. in his hair, in his beard and everything, right? <laughs> and he's just like lying there on the floor covered in shit. And then all of a sudden, all the lights go off. And the bloke the bloke at McDonald's is locking up. <laughs> and he, he locks up and like, he must have, he must have been like closing about the bag. He, so he, he's gone in there. Uh, locked up the whole place and starts going home so he's, he's like lying there in the pitch black manages to manages to find his phone <laughs> manages to find his phone which I'm sure has got shit on it as well and he, he phones this last outside he's like hello um, has the bloke come out 
He says, yeah, 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 you're going to have to stop me. I'm still in here. <laughs> so <laughs> he, has to, he has to basically try to clear himself up the best he can. This bloke goes back in and opens the door again. And he has to, like, I think he, like, ditches his boxes, like, but uh, he, he has to go out and, like, like shit on his t-shirt and everything <laughs> and uh, just like a pure like walk of shame you know <laughs> apparently when they got back in the car and they started driving away and there's like silence and then after sort of 30 seconds she goes you stink by the way <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh. <laughs> so congratulations man that's like the second time I've cried on this podcast. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's just the great shit story never gets old, man. And even <laughs> even like even though you know it, I know everything about that story, I still fucking laugh through the whole thing. Oh, it's just so amazing. And horrible. Like, I mean, we've all had some bad some bad instances, right? But that is just like so next level. <laughs> It really is. <laughs> Jesus. Oh. Guy Labrick, oh. everybody. <laughs> so I love to have like uh accomplished guests on the show and then and then that's how you'll be remembered. No one will remember painter, guitar player, you know, no, nice no. guy. No, just oh the guy with the shit story, like John yeah. I think like the better the guitar player, the better their shit stories. Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> Like I've seen you play, man. We're definitely going to talk about shit on the podcast. It's great. <laughs> yeah. It's flattering. That's a compliment. Yeah, that's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to oh, do. <laughs> whew, man, I feel like I almost like I did some inadvertent sit-ups on this podcast just from like laughing and <laughs> gut It's a problem with crunches. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, shit, man. Great. Thanks so much for uh, making the time. I know it's late over there, dude. And it's... Uh, that's and we, been cool. We, chat yeah, here and there you. but we haven't that a face to face so to speak and <laughs> who knows man remember we've known each other so long we was we were used to talk on the uh msn messenger or whatever the fuck on the old that's uh, right microsoft yeah. stuff yeah <clears throat> i think there was one time i called you and it cost like 200 quid or something like that <laughs> oh man yeah i fucked up bad the first time i had a my first phone bill out there it was like oh jesus christ back in the day yeah. Old school, yeah, long distance phone call shit, man. <clears throat> Jesus, yeah. Good old days. Or the bad old days, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Good combination of both. But uh yeah, man, uh, dude, always great to talk to you. See you, man. Um and uh shit. I, I hope we uh all get through this okay and things get back to normal s and then I, I would love to come over there again or hopefully you'll come back over here I'll have to do new yeah i'd love to we'll, we'll, we'll do that something sometime, someday, definitely right? <clears throat> yeah awesome all right brother well everybody there you have it guy laverick virtuoso guitar player um <laughs> and uh and shit story connoisseur hope you've enjoyed listening <laughs> i'm skunk manhattan with victor ramos until next time take care laters Good to the floor.